Magpie Games provided me with a hardback copy of Root the RPG's core book for this review. Content warnings are in the description alongside a link to this essay's video footnotes, which can be watched alongside or following your viewing experience. Thank you to my patrons for making this video possible. I've been thinking a lot about alienation. It's become a kind of in-joke, actually. Someone will say something about their job or their boss or something they own or someone they know, or maybe there'll just be a pause between topics in a conversation. And I'll say, I've been thinking a lot about alienation. And I'll smile because it's become a kind of in-joke. With myself, fittingly enough. Holy shit, is this my house? Dylan, listen. It started with a thought experiment, likely inspired by our digital age. How thoroughly could I document a single day of my life? I could record the things I said and why I said them, the actions I took, and the objects I used to take them, but I quickly realized how deep that rabbit hole goes. This spoon is from Kroger, this bowl is from Ikea, but that's as much as I know about them. If I tried to track down the nature and origin of every object in my everyday life, I could spend years and still never get there. But is there such thing as a door factory? I didn't think so until I worked in one. <laughs> Suddenly struck with a profound need to see the thousands of invisible people on the other end of all these objects who had no idea I exist, I thought, if I lost everything, every single one of the objects I own, how many of the people that made them would even notice? At the time, only one thing came to mind. This is a piece of original art by author and illustrator Luca Reitz, who I met during a layover in South Korea. It came with my copy of Ultraviolet Grasslands, and I showed it in a video, so theoretically he knows I own it. In my silly thought experiment, I imagined him hearing all my things had been lost in some nebulous tragedy, and thinking, oh, that little drawing I did for them is probably gone too. I don't think it's a coincidence that this object is something I would call a piece of art. Over here, Violet. Hey, uh, so what have you got for me today? Well, we are starting with a TV show and a video game and then a board game with a few extras sprinkled in the middle and then finishing it off with a tabletop game. Oh, that's broader than usual, huh? <laughs> Yep, and with all this chit-chat, we are already behind schedule. Right. <clears throat> uh, Severance on Apple TV Plus is a show about the work-life balance and its important place in a healthy life. It's about the dangers of unionization and, and the mystery of just what are they doing down there with those weird numbers. My favorite line from episode one is when Miss Cobell says, My department like yours can go so good or so bad. You know, it makes a difference. When Mark lacks a reply, she answers... The people. Technically, severed workers each contain two people. One who only has at-work memories, and another who only has away-from-work memories. So it's important to note that Miss Cobell is talking about the workers here. For a department to go so good and not so bad, the workers need to, well, do what they're told. Lumen knows what they want from their workers, so they built a societal microcosm to create it. It's culture, not as a map of behavior, but a map for behavior. So why do the workers follow along with this corporate map for behavior? Is it mind, mind control? control facility. That, uh, that their mind cannot be controlled behavior by still talks about stop these the things universe. early while we still can. Stop what early? Um, well, it's not mind control. MDR's four employees each have their own assimilation style. 
not acculturation style. Fun fact, with no source culture, severed workers can only really assimilate. Dylan is driven by the company's extrinsic rewards, erasers, finger traps, caricature portraits, and waffle parties. Irving is intrinsically motivated by the promises found in the scriptural employee handbook. Mark is a rule follower, not to chase incentives, but to avoid punishment and to maintain a normal office environment. Helly, well, Helly's a problem worker. She doesn't understand why the rules are important or why the work is important or why she'd want erasers if there are no pencils. And punishment didn't help her see the bigger picture either. So in the meantime, they tried to encourage a positive attitude and keep her motivated. Did you give her directed praise? Directed praise, yes. Miss Cobell knows what's up. I'm sure Lumen's employee management handbook says that all reinforcers should be paired with specific verbal praise. After all, being praised with a reward and a smile lets you know you're behaving correctly. With tools like these, there's no doubt Helly's behavior will take a turn for the best. Um, but that's more than enough analysis for one video. So you know what? I have an idea. I think what the internet needs is for someone to explain the ending. What did that last episode mean? What even happened? Yes, one second. Uh, what, what were the events in order? Someone list them, quick. I can't understand metaphors or interpret media. Okay, no, that's only half the story. Also, sorry if you think the goats are important, because the show just immediately makes fun of you. Season one isn't about goats or numbers. Season two might tackle those subjects and how being disconnected from the product of your labor detaches you from the consequences of your labor, but that happens even when people do know what they're doing. Severance season one is about alienation from top to bottom. There's the literal self-estrangement in the room, but workers are also alienated from each other, their workplace, their superiors, who are in turn alienated from their superiors, and of course, they're alienated from the product of their labor, as evidenced by the question that's constantly asked, implicitly and explicitly. What is it we actually do here? But it's not just at work. Mark's empty company housing is meant to mirror the office space that never quite filled up. Rickon's privileged platitudes in The UUR are mind-blowing to the innies and Rickon's book club for the same reason. Not because the book club members are secretly severed, I hope, but because despite not being severed, they also live in an alienated society. It's not an exact one-to-one, -one, but it's, it's metaphorical, a, a similar tool working toward a similar end. So it's important to note that this doesn't work. Women used alienation, gamification, punishment, and incentives to control their workers' behavior, yet the entire department fell apart. The corporate map for behavior was abandoned. Granted, it was a long process that was helped along by human nature and the power of love, but in order to really understand why it happened, in order to explain the ending, so to speak, we need to talk about Helly and Mark. And the story of a man named Stanley. With unionizations sweeping the US, a well-received TV show that credits it as a primary inspiration, and a shiny new re-release, the Stanley Parable feels as relevant as ever. The new Ultra Deluxe Edition might poke fun at sequels and re-releases, but it's definitely a title worth returning to. Every iteration packs a punch. It razzes on video game developers, pokes fun at players, and even manages to critique the institutions that govern our everyday lives. In this video, we're going to uncover three layers of meaning hidden in the Stanley Parable. You might think this will be a cinch because Kevin Brighting's witty narration explains basically every step you take through the game, but the deeper we go, the more complex the densely layered web of profound philosophical insights will become. We'll compare old content with new content, explain some endings, and, with some assistance from a real-life professor of philosophy, we might even untangle this parable. I'm Vi Huntsman, and this is Collapse Without Permission. The Stanley Parable has 22 endings, as shown on this popular flowchart. Most of them are considered endings because they restart the game or require you to restart the game, but others, like the Broom Closet and Secret Disco, are only endings in the loosest sense of the word. 
Luckily for us, there is a definitive correct ending. The freedom ending. Many fans consider this to be the game's real ending for a number of reasons. This is the only ending where Stanley does everything the narrator says. The achievement given for this ending is called Beat the Game. The narrator says it's the game's intended ending. And this is the only ending where it is possible to obtain the speedrun achievement. In the story. Aha! The story. Stanley realizes no one's around to tell him what to do, so he goes looking for his coworkers, then searches for his boss, stumbles onto a mind control facility, rejects its control, and sets off into a bright new tomorrow. It's uh, not a very good story, apologies to the narrator, but it's trying its best to dramatically tackle some big ideas. To see it, all you have to do is follow along. Easy enough, right? My story! You've destroyed my work! Ah, uh, well, apparently not. There are plenty of reasons a video game might want you to behave a certain way. Maybe it's trying to tell a story, move you in a certain direction, or squeeze a few more dollars out of your wallet. The narrator has a story he wants to show you, but from the moment Stanley wakes up to the moment he reaches an ending, you are in control. Even if there's a correct choice, you get to choose between left and right, red and blue, up and down. Because, you know, it's a video game. That's why, in the aptly titled Choice Ending, it removes your ability to choose between up and down. The narrator realized you can make meaningful choices, so he removed your ability to choose incorrectly. This tension between the intended story and player freedom reminds me of all the stories people tell about Bethesda games where they decide they'd rather romp about in the irradiated wilderness than look for their son or father or whoever. And how, if you do follow the game's lead, it pretends you have agency while manipulating probabilities and forcing you onto a digital railroad anyway, because they only programmed one story. The Stanley Parable is constantly making fun of games like this, usually with the narrator being the butt of the joke. He complains and yells as you refuse to follow instructions again and again, jumping off of things and trying to escape the level geometry. But here, after following the adventure line, the manifestation of a linear path with no choices, the narrator says something interesting. He suggests that, maybe, a story can emerge from the player through the simple act of moving forward, rather than being the result of predetermined planning. The game later calls this rambling nonsense philosophy because it's kind of a lie. You see, a video game can only comprehend a limited number of inputs. So, for example, in this ending, the narrator tells Stanley to abandon the adventure line, to go wild and use his imagination to make up his own story. But even as he says this, you're still walking around those same office hallways. So if I decided Stanley's coworkers were... I don't know, abducted by aliens, or that Stanley had a crush on the narrator, there's no way I can communicate that to the Stanley parable. I've left the linear path to make up my own story, hooray, but since the game already has a story in mind, I'm going to run up against its plans sooner rather than later. And sure enough, here's that adventure line again, metaphorically rearing its ugly head. So, if layer number one is, haha, video game developers get mad when I disobey, in layer number two, the game asks, why are you fighting against it so hard? Now, instead of making fun of the narrator, the game's kind of making fun of me. Because video games can only comprehend a limited number of inputs, they often have specific plans for their players, and they reasonably assume that their players want to follow along and won't be surprised if a quest is impossible to fail, the doors mysteriously close behind them, or the elevator conveniently breaks down at its destination. Games signal what they want you to do by taking away choices like this. This story isn't about how you ride the elevator back up, the game seems to say. But hold on, why not? You know, this actually reminds me of a different elevator. No, not that one yet. Toward the end of the Gloomwood demo, there's this room full of tough enemies called Crowmen. There are enough here that you probably can't take them out with your limited health and ammunition, so after you presumably sneak past them all, you can call the elevator which brings it rumbling down to meet you. But when it arrives... Every enemy in the room is alerted to your position. It's meant to be a climactic moment where all that's between you and certain death is the elevator door as you ride your way back up to safety. I hated this moment. In fact, I obstinately rode the elevator back down to see if the alarm rang every time it arrived at the bottom. My hunch was right, it was just that once. So I might not have had a reason to ride the elevator back up in the Stanley Parable, but I was frustrated the game didn't let me. So you can imagine how pleased I was to find this was fixed in the Ultra Deluxe Edition where I cheerfully rode that elevator back up to the top and back down again just because I could. 
The book Cybertext, Perspectives on Ergodic Literature, can help us explain what's going on here with what it calls the ergodic contract. According to this idea, texts frame their experiences by telling you how to interact with them and promising if you do, you'll get something meaningful. So in the Stanley Parable, your modes of interaction are walking around and pushing buttons. The book says this contract is broken when a game has, in this case, already decided which path you'll walk and which buttons you'll push, and punishes you when you choose incorrectly. To punish the non-cooperative player, the designer must break the illusion of free interaction and instate first thought control, then narrative control. This makes it look like the player's fault for disobeying, but in reality, it is the designer who has broken the ergodic contract. Thought control, huh? Well, there we have it. We can go back to the second layer and answer, I'm being defiant and choosing incorrect answers because I want to make my own choices. You're breaking the ergodic contract. And then the game spins around in its chair and says, wrong. You're being defiant because we've mind controlled you to do so. Well, shit. <laughs> so uh, I might have left something out of that elevator story. I didn't just ride the elevator down or down, then back up, then back down. I wrote it down, then up, then down, then up, then down, then up again, because I realized it leads to a new ending. The game left a breadcrumb trail of new voice lines to keep me going where it wanted me to, and I followed it without thinking twice. This is the third and final layer, how the entire game is predetermined, which gives these flowcharts new meaning. They're maps for behavior. Each node is one of the astoundingly few things the game responds to. It's every path and every button. If you try to impose your will on the game like I did, it either doesn't react or it co-opts your choices back onto its map for behavior. The problem with freedom in games is that your choices aren't meaningful unless they're choices, and they're not choices unless all of the consequences are real. But if a game's trying to tell a story, one of those consequences might be that you tell the story wrong. To circumvent that, The Stanley Parable just gives you almost no choices. <laughs> it's a game with no wrong answers, convincing its players their choices are meaningful by pretending there are right and wrong answers. So if Stanley was mind controlled into pushing buttons all day at his boring job, we might say that I was mind controlled into playing the game exactly how it wanted me to all along. In fact, I lied again, I didn't ride that elevator six times, I rode it 12 times, six with the bucket and six without. Don't ask about the bucket. Praise Gambarata. I loved playing this game after watching Severance, spotting the moments where they're working with the same subject matter, the nature of agency itself. One of my favorite connections is right here in the work ending. The narrator plays a prank on Stanley where he's about to meet his wife, but she doesn't exist, it's just a blank 3D model. The narrator monologues in his apartment, reinforcing the metaphor that if it wasn't already clear, you are Stanley, obediently pushing buttons at your computer. Each button press turns apartment 427 into office 427, one object at a time. It's here that this happens. And I'm trying to tell him this, that in this world he can never be anything but an observer, that as long as he remains here, he's slowly killing himself. But he won't listen to me, he won't stop. Here, watch this. Stanley, the next time the screen asks you to push a button, do not do it. Look at that prompt. Look at it. It says, please press X to be at work in the morning. At the same moment that the narrator is emphasizing your inability to resist the game's commands. It's the game saying, you can't not go to work. You have no choice. I have no choice. Well, every time you find yourself here, it's because you chose to come back. Maybe employment is coercive, huh? Maybe it has to be to force people to work meaningless jobs in an alienated society. <laughs> so the Stanley Parable has given us an important piece of the mind control puzzle. By constraining a person's options, which is to say the choices they're allowed to make, you can control their... mind? That's poetic, especially considering Severance has implants that literally change how your brain works. But while it's not quite accurate, it is close enough for now. <laughs> the game clearly thinks this mind control stuff is bad. <laughs> On its face, the freedom ending is a hopeful story about Stanley escaping mind control, while the museum ending literally begs you, the player, to escape, to quit the game. 
and its reason is very specific. When every path you can walk has been created for you long in advance, death becomes meaningless, making life the same. Living without real choices is like being dead. Once I really processed this, I started seeing it everywhere. One ending makes a Minecraft joke, so I looked up Minecraft's end credits poem, which says, to tell a person how to live is to prevent them living. I watched The Truman Show, because it shares some DNA with both the Severance and the Stanley Parable, and realized it ends with Truman choosing a real life over a false heaven, because here he has no agency. All we're missing is a hell metaphor, and lo and behold. <laughs> Thanks for describing my version of hell. Uh, lo and behold, severance comes in clutch with a heavily emphasized hell metaphor. Not only does the show juxtapose Mark's housing with a graveyard, the severed floor is the worker's hell because at work, their agency, even their personhood is taken away. As Helly's Audi tells her, I am a person. You are not. I make the decisions. You do not. But Helly realized she could make choices. She had tons of choices. It's just that most of them weren't on Lumen's map for behavior, because in real life, agency can't be mapped onto a flowchart. But what about in games? What about the Stanley Parable? Can you map and manipulate people's agency? Can you control people's minds in, say, tabletop games? I think it's finally time to start answering that question. Well, sir, I don't know very much about mind control. Who does? Uh, the uh, RPG design panel cast hosts panel recordings about analog games. I got really excited looking through their backlog where I found exactly what I was looking for. A 2011 panel titled Game Design is Mind Control, hosted by Luke Crane, author of Burning Wheel and soon to be head of Kickstarter's entire games category, and Jared Sorensen, self-proclaimed founding father of indie role-playing. Unfortunately, it's maybe the most vapid hour of noise I've ever experienced. It starts with 10 real life minutes of weird, unfunny jokes about Finnish and pederasty and women <laughs> before 50 minutes of them trying their hardest to make as few claims as possible while praying no one notices they don't talk about tabletop role playing hardly at all. Crane and Sorensen were really trying to say something. Um, or maybe they were trying to say nothing? Somehow they failed at both. But let's quickly figure out what they said so we can move on to something worthwhile. They start by claiming games have three primary components. Mechanisms, feedback, and rewards. And it's best if those rewards are constant and random. You know, like Farmville and gambling. They then say that game designers are dopamine dealers, and if it sounds like they're saying players are lab rats and games are Skinner boxes, it's because they are, that is what they're saying. They discuss a whopping 19 games in their 50 minute presentation, which is way too many games, trust me. Um, but eventually they talk about how in Clue, players often have favorite characters to play and they talk in bad British accents, despite neither of those things affecting the game. It's not like Professor Plum has a plus two to finding secret doors, they say. They claim this happens because of avatar identification, before quickly moving on without addressing how it breaks their idea of games as just mechanisms, feedback, and rewards. Luckily for us, they change the subject to... So, D&D, who's played D&D? Oh my god, oh, D&D, perfect. Oh my goodness, 45 minutes into the hour-long thing. D&D. After mobile games, video games, board games, and racing, they finally mention a tabletop role-playing game. I'm excited to be making a similar mistake. <laughs> So they claim that in proto d, d players would just move their piece two squares and calculate Thacko until... Eventually one of the guys went, you, Kobold, what is your name? And, and Gary was like, what are you doing? And then they started role-playing. So why? We have some theories. I cannot wait to hear what those theories are. So a, a lawful fighting man walks into a room. The room is full of goblin 
babies. <laughs> oh my god. So so they can't make claims. There, this is just anecdote to anecdote. We said, Cobalt, what's your name? And now we're talking about the, the baby monsters dilemma. Okay, so they're trying to say that D&D &D was a board game, just like Clue, but people mistakenly started using it as a role-playing game because of too much avatar identification? I think that's what they're saying, which is like, I don't know, kind of close, yet so far, especially in context where they say there are no characters in Clue right before they say there's no role-playing in D&D. &D. They finish off this disaster by explaining that board games are different than tabletop games and tabletop games are different from each other. Maybe it's deeper than that, but they literally skip their conclusion slide to cheat two guys out of a dollar with a game theory demonstration they fundamentally misunderstand. That's it. That's the panel. I have no idea what it had to do with mind control. Can we talk to a professional? Is game design mind control? <laughs> and if not, why might it be mistaken for that? Okay. This is a great question because I think right next door there is something that uses game ish stuff, which is mind control. So, I mean, I'm willing to say gamification is mind control. Okay. Wow, that was easy. <laughs> so, games aren't necessarily mind control, but they're right next door. So, what are games? And what games are are a package of environment, obstacles, goals, and abilities harmonize together. So the quick way I have of saying this is that game design is the art of agency, right? Mm -hmm. That game designers work in the medium of agency itself. This is already looking more optimistic than Skinner boxes, but calling games codified agencies, or honestly, even calling them art, has some very important implications. Luckily for us, Nguyen wrote an entire book about those implications. Games Agency as Art was written to build a foundation for game analysis, a way to discuss games' as artistic merits without comparing them to novels or movies or whatever. Nguyen decided the best place to start would be with what he calls Suitsian Games and Suitsian Playings, named after the definitions laid out by Bernard Suits. I'll explain the concept in a second, but focusing on a specific way to play a specific kind of game creates a category of experience that can be discussed and because those experiences are all about making choices it looks a whole lot like games are narrowed specified agencies the best way to demonstrate this is obviously to put it to the test it's a foundation for analyzing games so let's take a close look at this book alongside a game that actually i hear new and really likes Root, a game of Woodland Might and Right, is a highly asymmetrical war game and mobile app for one to six players, but please don't play with more than four. Following the absolutely cutthroat rules designed by Cole Worley, each player has a unique set of abilities that unfold across a three-phase turn, where you can place tokens, battle with your adorable meeples, play cards adorned with Kyle Farron's absolutely magnetic artwork, and, of course, score points. You can win by being the first to obtain 30 victory points, achieving and fulfilling an alternate win condition, or by playing the Vagabond and teaming up with the underdog, so if they win, you both win. If we look at Nguyen's list of game components, these victory conditions reveal the first and most important piece of a Suitsian game. The goal. I think the most important for me, the most unlocking moment, was Reiner Knitia, the German board game designer, okay. who in an interview says, the point system is the center of games. Uh, because it tells the players what to care about. It sets their motivations in the game. And there's a part of me when I read this as a game player, that's like, of course, that's right. And there's a part of me, the philosopher and the philosopher of art, who's like, holy shit, <laughs> like that's completely right. And also something that goes unnoticed in this really weird way. So I'm gonna jump right into the weeds and say that goals are integral to discussing Suitsian games as agency spaces because in tandem with the rest of the game, they measure your performance in a standardized way. If every player is chasing the same goal, you can analyze their choices against how well it furthered their progress toward the game's goal. Going back to our example, 
playing root is the only way to answer the question, how good are you at navigating these obstacles with these specific abilities to reach this goal when pitted against the other players? Right? Suitsian games. So that's measurement, but the game slash agency package doesn't just measure you against the other players, it measures you in the same way it measures everyone else who's ever played the game. This means every play session involves making similar decisions for similar reasons, um, which constitutes the game. That's games are agency, games agency is art, da 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 da, okay? Making choices, cool. Okay, but this is why rules are so important, right? The points are important, yeah, the goal contextualizes everything you do, yeah, but as Nguyen said... Because it doesn't even count as crossing the finish line unless you did it inside the constraints. Then what we care about is not just the goal in and of itself, we care about that goal as achieved in a particular way that is constitutively inefficient. When Nguyen says finish line here, he's talking about a literal finish line, but it applies to root just as easily. From a bird's eye view of the game, it's meaningless to just move your score tracker to 30. The value lies in overcoming the obstacles constructed by the rules. Which means, if we extrapolate far enough, if you break those rules, if you cheat or stack the deck or take extra actions, then as Nguyen says, it doesn't count. Now, that's a really interesting word. What doesn't it count as? Well, one, uh, it doesn't count as winning, <laughs> because you circumvented the game's ability to measure you within its constraints. But it also kind of doesn't count as root, because cheating breaks the standardization. So I was looking around on the root Reddit, right? And uh, I found this play report that started with a string of qualifiers, like what factions were in play, which board setup, advanced or normal start, how many landmarks. All of these factors change how the game works, but they're all official variations on the core rule set, which means they can be analyzed as such. Just look, look at how much analysis goes into comparing the base deck to an expansion deck. Huh? I mean, I mean I'm in frame. <laughs> look at this. You can, it just goes on and on. Cheating, on the other hand, has no bounds or standardization and can't be analyzed or compared to anything else, including other playings where cheating happened. <laughs> when you enlisted a bunch of ways to cheat at racing, he called them, quote, ways to reach the end state that aren't playing the game. What this means is that a playing where you cheat is not a Suitsian playing, and consequently, Suitsian analysis cannot address it. But we can. <laughs> in fact, I'm extremely interested in what lies inside and outside the bounds of Suitsian design. So by the end of this video, we're going to address a lot of weird stuff that we can only see by looking at games as they're played. So let's do exactly that. Uh, we're going to start with some help from Camo, the non-binary master of the Eerie Dynasties. Yeah, That's your plans? Oh, oh plans. plans. Whoa. <laughs> We're jumping right into the thick of it, looking at Camo's last two turns. So there's a lot to take in, so here's what's going on. Bird. Being good at the Eerie Dynasties is all about pre-programming your behavior by putting cards in The Decree, an ever-growing list of actions that you must perform every round for as long as you can in a particular order. Recruit, move, battle, build. In their penultimate turn, Camo earned a bunch of points at once by promising to build two roosts in color-specific clearings, and then doing that. This means that next turn, they're doomed. See, if you ever can't fulfill your decree because, for example, you promised to build two roosts in color-specific clearings, and it's nearly impossible to do that two turns in a row in a four-player game, <clears throat> uh, then your government melts down, you lose a few points, and you have to empty your decree which can be good sometimes. But lucky for Camo, build is always the Eerie's last action, which means, if they can pull it off, they have an entire turn of recruiting, moving, and battling ahead of them before their government falls apart. So when their next turn began, they boldly added not one, but two more cards to the, their decree and revealed their true plan. I'm going to take the domination thus. I'm going to acquire three boys here, two boys here, one boy right here. That is so many birds. So I don't think I've seen so many birds on the board. So they, they activated an alternate win condition, 
recruited six birds, which is, I can't emphasize this enough, so many birds, and then they moved into position to attack. They rolled two damage, taking out both my guys, and, well, I thought my precious sympathy token would stay intact. So you only have one battle card, though. Yeah, and, that's and that was your one battle, and so okay. you can't well, battle well, my no, sympathy. Well, no, but I have the extra damage. Because I'm the leader. I have the one extra leader damage. Big brain. No! <laughs> this sucks ass. I calculated it. It was planned. All according to Kakaku. <laughs> Kakaku? It might be kind of hard to see how cool this is, um, but executing 11 actions in one turn in order where eight of the 11 have to happen in color specific clearings is intense and impressive. And that's without even mentioning how Camo was deliberately banking valuable cards in their decree to keep them from me because of how often they had to give me cards from their hand. <laughs> like, first things first, what's cool about this sequence is how clever Camo's moves were. Despite it being the first time they played the game, they were already making genuine, nuanced choices. Nguyen is really clear about this. Games are art, but what you're admiring is the beauty of your own maneuvering within the agential play space, what he calls the aesthetics of deciding and acting. This makes the racing example from before especially apt, because lots of people run races and play games without expecting to win, because the experience itself in this case, Camo's struggle to win as the Eerie Dynasties is valuable enough to be the object of our appreciation. Even if they broke the rules! That's right, upon reviewing the footage to write this section, I saw Camo move across the forests twice. These guys, and be here. And you know what? Deep down, I don't know if this is a big deal. <laughs> The rivers are marked on their Kakaku, so I, I, it was probably an honest mistake. And besides, it's absurdly easy to cheat at root. Every single player is playing a different game. Do you think anyone knows how the Woodland Alliance wins every time? <laughs> no, no one knows. It's because no one's watching the supporter stack. The game is complex enough that one of my friends said they'd probably have to, to, to just get a grasp of the basic rules of the core box set, they'd have to play the game eight times. I don't even think I've played a game yet where every player followed every rule correctly. It's tough. We're people, not computers. And none of my friends are serious board game people, which is probably a big part of it. Speaking of computers, this is kind of why I wish I'd tried the mobile app um, for a kind of truer experience. Um, because not only does it enforce 110% rule following, theoretically, <laughs> playing online also makes it a lot easier to get through lots of games. Um, this is on my mind because in our interview, Nguyen talked about the importance of repeat encounters with Suitsian games. How well-designed board games can unveil themselves in this way. How they can explode in density, complexity, and beauty across 30, 50, or hundreds of playings. Which means, at time of writing, I've yet to grasp the game itself as an aesthetic object. I'm not talking about the box's construction, or how much the meeples weigh, or the art. I've grasped the art plenty, it's, it's amazing. I'm talking about how in the root board game and other Sutian games, every single choice the players can make is a direct product of the game's constraints. Which means those constraints, the rules, are admirable too, for the way they consistently mold our play into a certain category of shape. When Ewan wrote about this in his book, he said, Game playing experiences have moderately reliable experiential characteristics, which are shared across many players, and which seem to be related to the intentional efforts of the game designer. In fact, that reliability is so common that it's easy to overlook the extraordinariness of the game designer's achievement. So I've been conditioned <laughs> to oppose this kind of wording surrounding game designers. And while I might be coming around to it, my very first question is inevitably going to be, Okay, which parts though? Where does the designer's partial credit start and stop? For me, the answer lies in what it means for something to be inside or outside the rules. If Root has an ergodic contract, the rules are a finite list of actions that are the game. So when you break the rules, your experience exits the game's artistic frame. Which means, first of all, the designers don't get credit for the cheating. <laughs> That's on Camo, or me as a subpar teacher. Or, I, I don't know, the game's really complex. We could blame the designers if we wanted to. 
but they also don't get credit for our amazing kakaku joke. Um, but that's not cheating, that's something else. Here's a better example. In our game, if I had described a guerrilla squadron of ruthless beavers sneaking up river from my base to defend the rebellion, someone might have accused me of cheating. <laughs> but I'm not cheating. I'm just telling a little make-believe story while I play a bird-themed ambush card. It's not even, not even beaver-themed. Just like saying Stanley has a crush on the narrator, there's no way to tell the game that I have beavers. <laughs> because the boundary between the game and my make-believe of it is impermeable. Ideas cannot cross over. So even though I didn't move any pieces, didn't have any beavers, and it wouldn't have changed how I interact with the rules in the future, the game and the other players probably just expected me to imagine a generic ambush or maybe a bird ambush, because that's what does cross over. My choice to play an ambush card. That's inside the rules. And to me, that self-contained quality is what makes it Suitsian. So Whirly's team gets full credit whoa, for designing the rules and partial credit for the choices that players make inside the rules because their design created the existence of those choices. But if we focus too hard on that cross section where the designer gets credit, it's possible to take some strange turns. This phenomenon isn't as big of a deal in board games, as far as I can tell, um, but analyzing a game's rules means you can only see the actions that interact with the rules. And especially if we're talking about the intentional efforts of the game designer, it might start to look like every action of every player is controlled by the designer. It might start to look less like a codified agency and more like, well, Mind control. According to our book here, when you play a game, the designer is reaching through you, using your participation as a tool to create art for you to appreciate. Chapter four begins with a statement about this, which I haven't been able to stop thinking about since I read it. At this point, games may begin to look a little creepy. <laughs> they may start sounding a bit too agentially intrusive. To play a game is, on my account, to take on a new agency, an agency designed by somebody else. Nguyen spends the rest of chapter 4 refuting this idea that games are creepy, or more specifically, that they erode your real-life agency. He's very firm about this not applying to proper, close-ended, Suzy aesthetic striving games. <laughs> but I think this excerpt resonated with me because those aren't the only kinds of agencies you can design. and. This is where we go next door and ask, hey, what was that thing you said about things that are mind control? <laughs> In our interview, Nguyen contrasted Suitsian games with other apparatuses of control. Um, Twitter was actually his primary counterexample, but we've already got a pretty good example to work with. Severance. The phrase mind control brings to mind images of glassy-eyed stares and monotone speech, of Stanley robotically pushing buttons at his computer. This doesn't look like mind control. Mark doesn't look like his mind is being controlled. But sometimes Helly looks at him like he does. She gets this look on her face when people tell her she should care about erasers, even if there are no pencils. That she should care about numbers that don't mean anything. That she should respect her own body, even though it's being brandished like a tool by someone she hates. Games offer you goals and systems of priority. The phrase playing a game brings to mind a person wielding a controller, using a mobile device, or moving pieces around a board. This doesn't look like a game either. No one at Lumen looks like they're playing a game. Even if... That's 10 points off, you have 90 points remaining. Points? But according to Nguyen, it could be argued that Lumen's gamified work is mind control, a method of manipulation that's right next door to games. So, let's apply his framework to Lumen and try to answer that question from before. How does Lumen get their workers to do what they want? Well, the work at Lumen is gamified. Workers use computer abilities to overcome work obstacles, earn points, and reach a goal. Their performance is measured in a standardized way. If games contain values like Nguyen says they do, this is the corporation telling their workers that it's valuable 
to work. But the workers don't know what Lumen's goal is and don't really care about the work. Working isn't inherently valuable like playing a game is. In fact, the way that the Audis choose to not experience their shift, to like be at the end of their shift without overcoming the obstacles, makes working at Lumen the antithesis of a game-like activity. So, to make it all work together, Lumen has to use one more tool. The real way that Lumen gets their workers to do as they're told is by bridging the disconnect between the corporation's unknown mysterious goal and their workers' personal goals. Because workers do have their own goals, goals that could probably be achieved any number of ways. But at Lumen, they're only allowed to pursue those goals in the one way that also advances the corporation's goal. With a carrot and a stick and their workers trapped in a cage, Lumen's work gets done, but it requires those workers to make a goal of their own that fits that mold. Mark explicitly says as much in episode five. Don't you wanna at least- I told her I wanted out and she told me I wasn't a person. My own self told me that. Yeah, and, and that's horrible, but don't focus on her. What do you want in here? Irving sincerely wanted to enrich the world, to create smiles in the millions. How does he do that? By sorting these numbers. Dylan was genuinely motivated by rewards. How does he get them? By sorting these numbers. Mark wanted his coworkers to be a family that he could keep safe, and he can only maintain that normalcy by sorting numbers. And Helly, well, Helly's a problem worker. Her goal is to escape. She can't achieve that by sorting numbers, so Lumen wanted her to get a new goal. So she got a new goal. What I want is for her to wake up while the life drains out of her and to know it was me who did it. You'd think she can't achieve that by sorting numbers either, but here's where I finally explain the ending like I promised. By the last episode, yes, everyone is actually overcome by the power of love. Mark loves his coworkers like they're his family, but realizes they can't be happy at Lumen. Irving falls in love with Bert, but is forced to watch as Lumen undermines their relationship to keep him focused on their meaningless numbers. And Dylan, the most content of them all, realizes he has a son. And in the face of that, erasers and caricature portraits and waffle parties become meaningless. And by extension, for him and everyone else in MDR, the numbers become meaningless as well. But in episode eight, they're extremely focused on the numbers. Why? Didn't they change their goal? Yes, but they realize they can only achieve their new goal, destroy Lumen, by playing its game, by sorting numbers. Even as Heli becomes engrossed in her work, she's not being mind controlled. She's choosing to work very hard toward a very specific goal that she truly cares about. Because of her hard work, Lumen succeeds, the MDR department hits their quarterly quota, but Heli succeeds more because that means Dylan can stay after hours, which means they make contact with the outside, dealing a hefty blow to Lumen. Gamification is the first to last piece of our mind control puzzle. And right about now, it might seem like, okay, it's not mind control then, it's priority control or goal control. And while that's close, it's still not quite right. Trust me, I know, I've been through this before. It's why I relate to the characters in Severance on a personal level. I've done what they're doing. I've seen mind control in action. Not because I've worked an office job, I haven't, but because I don't relate to the innies, to Helly, Mark, Dylan, Irving, and Bert. I relate to Miss Casey to Mr. Milchek, and to a lesser degree, Miss Cobell. Because I've worked their jobs. I don't anymore. I quit uh, <laughs> Lumen <laughs> to uh, edit RPGs full time, <laughs> partially because 
I kept writing myself into stories as the villain, as cops and devils and robots, and partially because COVID-19 hit and I quarantined and just never went back to work. And some of you know where this is going, but I think to explain it, I want to share one of those stories I wrote. I want to share one where I saw myself in a character from the video game, Sunless Skies. There is a locomotive captain sailing the skies of the Reach. They hear of a place called Carillon, which lies to the north-northwest of New Winchester. They hear of me, of my need for chorister nectar for an experimental new therapy exercise. The devils say they improve souls. But what does improve mean? And for who? The presiding deviless explains. Our goal is to fix souls, to make them acceptable again. Most of those who come to us are volunteers. The rest are beyond the point of being able to volunteer. Needless to say, this is a horrifying place. It is full of suffering. It is full of devils. I am one of those devils. It is very important to inflict the correct punishment, the correct coercion. We're in the business of fixing people, and each flaw is fixed with the proper penance. The captain enters the Gaslight Terrace to undergo our therapies. Their stats are inadequate, so they fail repeatedly. Each time, the game gives a glimpse of someone who suffers nearby. This time, it's a gloomy gentleman who used to drink in excess, but without taking any pleasure from it. To fix this, he is getting a foot surgically removed. <sighs> By the time the captain is finally improved, the system's cracks are clearly visible. Each penitent, each flaw, each punishment, they're all independently chosen by the game's computer. There are 40 treatments for those seeking enlightenment, which the game calls Carillon Company, open parenthesis, and enlightenment, underscore punishment, close parenthesis. It doesn't care what the sin was, talking about your hobbies too much, avoiding social events, preferring pencils to pens. Each possible treatment is equally plausible. You might be subjected to customs you don't understand, be forced to perform in public, or have your eating restricted to food that's so unpleasant it's almost unbearable. This will fix them, I tell myself, as I watch the captain from afar. Their punishment? The game reports, it does not bear speaking of. They cannot laugh afterward. We must stop these things early while we still can. They have procedures to care for penitents of all ages, and I am quickly selected for training in the children's ward. I am taught to spot secret desires, to withhold attention when it's undeserved. I'm told of the lies they can tell and the worst habits they can develop. I need to be vigilant if I want to help them, if I want to prevent their souls from becoming unwell. I am invigorated and ready for my first penitent. The presiding devilist generates a penitent, a flaw, and a cure, just like the game. Your first penitent is ready for you. He covers his ears if he hears a noise that is even slightly above normal volume. For this, he must flush public toilets without covering his ears. I understand. Each flaw can be fixed with the proper penance. I understand and am escorted to my first penitent. There is a three-year-old autistic boy standing before me. He's blonde. He recently learned to speak. He enjoys a game where I hold a small plastic ice cream cone to my mouth and make two trumpet sounds followed by a clarinet squeak and a befuddled expression. He laughs and claps his hands and falls over. I am a friend and a playmate. I am a devil. We stand in an open bathroom stall. I ask him to flush the toilet without covering his ears. He fails. I tell him to try again. He is confused. He fails. Recalling my training, 
I gently hold both his wrists, move his hand to flush the toilet, and show him how to not cover his ears. He's frustrated and he's angry, but his mother understands. Most penitents are volunteers. The rest are beyond the position of being able to volunteer. We try again and again and again on later days. Eventually, the cracks become impossible to ignore. He doesn't want to enter the public bathroom. We cannot leave until he does. So we stand again in an open bathroom stall. He fails and protests and covers his ears. Guiltily, I ask him to listen to my instructions one last time. I show him how to cover his ears, how to hold his ear against his shoulder and plug his other ear with his hand, how to flush the toilet without hearing it. I'm transgressing. I'm not curing this penitent. So I lie. I lie and say he did not cover his ears. I lie to the presiding deviless. I pray she never finds out. So, um, I want to um, propose something to you, um, and I want you to tell me what it sounds like a formula for. Okay. So, um, how would you feel about a gamified daycare? <laughs> Where um, the uh, you earn points by acting neurotypical. This is a daycare for just autistic kids, <laughs> and you can only score points that a health insurance company can understand. <laughs> Thanks for describing my version of hell. Uh, <laughs> this is a real field of work called applied behavior analysis, or ABA. Workers who apply its techniques are called registered behavior technicians, or RBTs. I was an RBT, which means I implemented instructions written by behavior analysts to move kids' priorities from the nuanced, complex values of childhood to the narrow, indecipherable, institutional prescription of what it looks like to be normal. A common criticism of ABA is that it turns kids into robots. There's a pro-ABA article titled How to Teach ABA Without Making Your Child a Robot that calls this phenomenon the unintentional aftermath of great love. It tells the story of a boy who finally understood how to behave correctly on his birthday. He acted out the perfect, almost robotic motions of unwrapping one present, expressing gratitude, setting it aside, opening the next, expressing gratitude, on and on until there were none left so he could look up to his parents and be told he'd done what he was supposed to do. The article doesn't have an answer for how to do ABA without turning your kid into a robot. Just that it's important to... Uh, you know, not do that. ABA is the perfect example of mind control. Participation is involuntary. It replaces the subject's values with goals they don't understand, which can only be achieved through actions that are meaningless to them. It's horrific and so absurdly evil that Nguyen couldn't help but laugh at how fundamentally broken it was on every level. I really believe it's broken to its core. These problems are inherent to the form, the institutional, neurotypical, parent-marketed, behavior-obsessed form. I don't think I could fully explain ABA even with its own two-hour-long video. So before we go any further, let's return to comfortable ground. This, behaviorism, is the final piece of the mind control puzzle. <laughs> Sorry for calling it a puzzle. It shows us that when people say mind control, insofar as it exists outside of media, they're talking about how if you control someone's priorities, their goals, you might say, and their choices, the ways they're allowed to achieve those goals, you can control not their minds, but their behavior. Which leads me to three things I need to highlight about ABA before we move on. First, ABA is billed as therapy, literally billed. It's one of the only prescriptions covered by insurance companies for autistic people of any age because it reduces autistic behaviors in a way insurance company spreadsheets can understand. This means that as a prescription, a medication, it's not being used to fix souls so much as fix people's brains. Applied Behavior Analysis, ABA, is the process of systematically applying interventions based upon the principles of learning theory, 
to improve socially significant behaviors to a meaningful degree. Second, ABA is not emotional control. That's not to say there aren't emotions involved. RBTs are actually trained not to smile at kids who are behaving incorrectly. The underlying un uh, implication being that acting neurotypical is the only way they'll fit in or be loved. Also, when kids are older, correct behavior is tied to things they actually want. So just like in severance. <laughs> so I'm sure there'll be all kinds of emotions when they mess it up and don't act neurotypical enough. ABA might claim that it's helping kids live happier lives, but that's not what it's targeting, and that's not what it results in. Behaviorists don't care how you feel about the actions you're being asked to take, just that you go through the motions. It's literally called behaviorism. We all know that we can feel angry without expressing anger, that we can smile when inside we are crying. You can stop someone from expressing an emotion, but that doesn't make the emotion go away. Finally, behavioral control is extremely paternalistic. To attempt to control someone else's behavior, you must believe that you know what's best for them better than they do. It is inherently infantilizing, and all the media we've looked at so far agrees. Just watch. I'm going to let the clip play out this time. It's not your job to play nursemaid to every new refiner. Okay, so what is my job? Are you really asking me that? Yeah. What is it we actually do here? We surf gear, you child! So Mark's a child now, huh? And Miss Cobell took away his hallway privileges? Hallway privileges. Hmm. Okay. How about the Stanley parable? In this game, the baby crawls left towards danger. You click the button to move him back to the right. And if he reaches the fire, you fail. It's a very meaningful game, all about the desperation and tedium of endlessly confronting the demands of family life. For context, this happens after you choose every wrong answer possible. Going through the right door instead of the left one, not getting back on track, jumping off the platform, and then choosing the wrong primary colored door three times in a row. As if the player is a baby who doesn't realize they're crawling in the wrong direction, who must be shepherded back to safety by a long-suffering parental figure. Or maybe they're more like a dog, because two hours into the baby game, a puppy shows up, which you have to take care of in a similar way. I don't think they were specifically talking about ABA here, but this is so perfect, there's no way it was a coincidence. These mystery quotes I've been playing are from an article titled, Is ABA Really Dog Training for Children? A Professional Dog Trainer Weighs In. That title makes my skin crawl, but let's take a listen. And quite commonly on Twitter, I've seen people call ABA dog training for children. When I see that, I tend to go on Twitter rants and reply to it. Because from everything I have read and seen of ABA, it is not dog training for children. I would never treat a dog that way. <sighs> so, paternalistic and dehumanizing. <laughs> the text and audio for this article are linked below. It's comprehensive and it's bleak. And it probably doesn't sound like it has anything to do with games. Like, at all. And to apply this to games, you'd have to think that your players are like dogs you're trying to train, or kids you're trying to fix so that, what, they play games right? <laughs> and you'd have to find a way to embed your values deep into a game in a way that can be transmitted to... What's that song? Welcome to Stop oh, Hacking no. Mobile, a podcast oh, where we no. respond to stimuli oh, based on learning fuck. history. I'm Brandon. And I'm James. Today we'll talk about mechanical and social incentivization and how you can encourage players to do what you want. In June of 2017, the Stop, Hack, and Roll podcast, hosted by Brandon Leon Gambetta and James Malloy, released its 28th episode, titled Encouraging Incentivization. I've been thinking about it for literally years, and I'm morbidly excited to finally talk about it in a video. Uh, let's get the easy blows out of the way first. Does Brandon compare GMs and players to parents and children? Yes. Does he compare ABA to dog training? Yes. Okay, on to the good stuff. <laughs> you brought this idea to me and I was very much into it because I, in my professional life, am an applied behavior analyst at an inpatient psychiatric unit. Yeah. 
So Gambetta was a behavior analyst when this episode aired, which actually means he didn't apply behavior plans like me, he designed behavior plans. However, when I reached out to him in October of 2020, he said he no longer works that job and does think there are ethical issues, but very much stands by using modified ABA to teach coping skills to highly volatile, aggressive, non-autistic kids. So there's your disclaimer for what it's worth. The episode really starts about eight minutes in, when Malloy sets the stage by saying behaviorism is right under the hood of high genre games, but that it also applies to low genre games like Dungeons and Dragons, uh, and also to everything else, because everyone is always well, incentivizing everyone all the time. <laughs> if you look through a behaviorism lens, yes, everyone's incentivizing everyone all the time. That's kind of bleak, actually. <laughs> <laughs> They're just explaining the basics here, but I don't think anything will match my genuine reaction to what came next. I mean, if you look at things from a purely behaviorist perspective, right. Every behavior is being driven by some kind of incentive. Uh, in order for something, in order for a behavior to happen, you know, like behaviors don't talk about thought really. In order for a behavior to happen. <laughs> I forgot he said that. Behaviorists don't talk about thought really. Oh God. <laughs> oh God. Fuck. Oh, that's so bad. Immediately after this, Gambetta finishes his sentence, saying, in order for a behavior to happen, there has to be a stimulus to that behavior. What he and Malloy are doing is making a correct connection between ABA and radical behaviorism, the idea that everything is caused by some stimulus or incentive. Radical behaviorism believes that everything we do is a behavior. Your thoughts are behaviors. Your feelings are behaviors. All of them can be modified or altered through reward and punishment as consequences. To demonstrate this inherent, reliable connection between stimuli and behaviors, Gambetta uses the most fraught example imaginable. Electroshock therapy. He sets up a hypothetical where James's character steals something, causing Brandon to punish James with an electric shock. The hypothetical continues with James stealing again and Brandon administering, quote, another very painful electric shock. Not only is this horrific and legal in the US and totally inappropriate for a quirky joke on your tabletop podcast, Brandon. This is what happens next. Oh shock no, noticing a pattern. Are you likely to continue to steal in the future? <laughs> I mean, look, <laughs> yes, <laughs> but I am not a normal person. Uh, I'm committed. Right, exactly. To playing a character. Okay, let's stop and think about this. This is example number one. The foundation for Gambetta's claim that he can change your behavior. An example so heavy handed that its use in present day Massachusetts on highly volatile, aggressive, disabled kids was literally called torture by the UN. No, I'm not gonna drop how much I fucking hate his example. But even after all that, it's just immediately undermined. Some things are larger than reward and punishment. Empathy, for example, creative language, storytelling, music. The problem here is that Gambetta doesn't have an answer for why Malloy would continue to steal. Because, you know, he can't talk about thought. <laughs> Which means this contradiction is under the surface of every single claim for the rest of the entire episode. Every new example begs the question, is stealing right or wrong for this story? Is your character turning into an NPC good or bad? Is getting arrested heroic or frustrating? Is constant failure annoying or are there times it's good actually? Is this rewarding or is it punishing? It is impossible to do behaviorism if you don't have an answer to that question. Luckily, there are two ways to answer it. The first way is asking one person in the moment, is this what you want? Tragically, that sample size is utterly useless for a behaviorist. The second way is asking, does this align with the values I'm trying to impose? Unsurprisingly, because they're talking about modifying behavior, they use the second method every single time. If you properly are understanding that it's a cool thing, then it encourages you to do it. If you're properly if you understanding, understanding. Oh, please understand. 
Now, I want to say, I don't think Gambetta is making a heel-turning endorsement of electroshock therapy here. He makes it very clear that he's against the old-fashioned way of doing things within ABA and within tabletop gaming, that he doesn't think punishments work as well as incentives. Right, and Rewards. a lot of the older games have a lot of things about punishing your characters. Like, there are so many games that just say, uh, hey, if, you're, if your players are being a pain, punish them with this. Yeah. And that's crazy. We're friends getting together, wanting to do something. Yeah. Ugh. It's like, he's so close, you know? <laughs> like, trying to subversively alter people's behaviors to align with values that you've decided are better for them or society or the gaming table with punishment isn't the problem. It's the subversively altering people's values part that's bad. <laughs> like... Gambetta opens the podcast with a joke about treating Malloy like a lab rat in a Skinner box, but he never says psych. He just pivots from electroshock therapy to... Fuck. But if I gave you a cookie every time... And that's when I realized... Well, thank you. How thoughtful. Would you like a chocolate? Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, this, uh, this section is beat for beat a Big Bang Theory episode. I'm just saying you, you catch can catch more, more flies, flies with, with honey, honey than with vinegar. vinegar. You're not squirting her in the face with water. No, of course not. We're talking very, very mild electric, electric shocks. <laughs> okay. I know what you're doing. Really? Yes. You're using chocolates as positive reinforcement for what you consider correct behavior. <laughs> So his delivery is really stilted here because the wording is a little too specific for a sitcom. Um, and I'm not happy with their electroshock joke either. But Leonard saying it's what you consider correct behavior is exactly correct. This notoriously vapid sitcom has correctly identified that Sheldon is trying to align Peggy's behavior with his subjective values. Let's see how Gambetta and Malloy do. You just got a cookie. Yeah. And that's actually going to reinforce the behavior. If a behavior is working for what you want to happen, mm -hmm. uh, it if a behavior is functional is probably the better way to word it. Yeah, that's not a better way to word it. What Gambetta's doing here is what ABA teaches all its practitioners to do, which is to skirt around this idea by using the weasel word functional. If you call a behavior functional, it helps the listener forget that the new values it comes with are subjective, that they're constructed. So what Brandon's not saying when he stumbles over his words here is that he decides what is functional. But he knows that. And so that's what you have to look at in terms of incentives, is how can we take a functional behavior, because players are already doing functional things at the table, yeah. Okay. Yeah. and replace it with an even more, with a behavior that is doing what we want them to do. Uh, yeah. it's, uh, 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 and replace it with an even more fun, with a behavior that is doing what we want them to do. <laughs> if you want your... <laughs> mm. <laughs> Breathe it in. <laughs> oh. well, it seems like... Like, this is weird, right? Uh, we try to talk about tabletop role-playing games, and the Game Design is Mind Control panel tells us that players are machines of input and output in a Skinner box. So we go to Nguyen, and he says that actually games allow us to make new sets of choices by constructing new agencies. So we try to talk about tabletop role-playing games again, and we're right back to saying games are Skinner boxes. Gambetta literally says well-designed games should be dopamine machines. What the hell is going on? Well... You see, people don't have pre-existing values about how, for example, they should move pieces around a game board. And if they do, if they're learning a new faction in Root, for example, that's a new way to measure performance, not a subtle value alteration. The reason ABA fits so well with game design for tabletop role-playing is because people do have pre-existing values for storytelling, maybe even specifically storytelling in tabletop role-playing games. and. If you try to intuit their values by looking at the rules of the game they're playing, it might start to look like those values are bad. And then you might take it upon yourself to impose new, better values on them. Like maybe, hypothetically. If you want your players to give a more thoughtful take on playing adventurers, but currently they're going around being murder hobos, and just like, 
destroying everything in your beautifully crafted fantasy land. Yeah. Yeah. So it's probably unsurprising that all of Gambetta and Malloy's examples of behaviors that need fixing describe imaginary players of Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> Equally unsurprising, all of their solutions involve moving to a different game because it's not just that the player behaviors are bad, their behaviors are bad because the incentives of the game are bad. Garbage in, garbage out. Here's Malloy's first example of this. Ron Edwards ran Ron the Edwards. Forge no, fuck. and wrote a bunch of things. And I feel like he was at the center of this community of people trying to figure out what was wrong with d and I remember at one point he said that d and is an exquisite system for simulating shopping and killing mm. and not much else. Who's let Ron Edwards out of a bag? If I were that player, I would would feel very tricked because you're expecting me to do like right. everything in this game is incentivizing me to do this <laughs> sorry technical difficulties uh that was james expressing uh that was nothing it was just james expressing confusion over how following the incentives of DD fourth edition didn't guarantee a heroic fantasy story there's this really important moment, actually, where he trips over his words to go from you're expecting me to do something to this game is incentivizing me to do something. When Malloy says that D&D is a low genre game or when he trips over his words like this, he's going from talking about the people around the table to talking about the rules. Same goes for Crane and Sorensen when they say there's no characters in Clue. They're talking about the rules. Or uh, when Brandon refers to the treasure hedonic treadmill of D&D. The treasure hedonic treadmill of D&D. Yeah. And it also applies, maybe more importantly than anything else, when he says that because D&D only gives you XP for combat... So you're not probably going to have players go in like, hey, I'm going to try to be super cute. Oh, you don't have that. You don't have that? People don't do that? Okay. Okay. Just making sure. And pretty and make people laugh. Yeah. But if you're playing Golden Sky Stories... Oh, my God. You will. Because that's where the incentive lies. Yeah. To translate, Gambetta is saying that's not part of the input, so it's not going to be part of the output. Which is such a bizarre way to view tabletop role-playing games of all things. Unless you look at just the rules and only the rules that support your argument, and then use those rules to imagine what the game is like. I know this is like the third time I've said this, but it is a very important point because when you do this, when you act like you can look at the rules of a TTRPG and know what the fullness of play looks like, you are conceptualizing tabletop role-playing games as Suitsian games. For now, uh, we're just going to assume that this is true, that TTRPGs are Suitsian. So if Suitsian games are abilities, environment, obstacles, and a goal, what's the goal of a tabletop role-playing game? What actions are being measured in a standardized way? Listening to Brandon, it's clear he thinks it's different for each game. He says that the proper way to play D&D, for example, is to make optimal combat decisions, and that that's what the game is about which isn't true. He says that's why wizards don't usually punch things because that's a suboptimal combat decision. His exception to this is that if it makes for a more compelling story beat, your wizard might punch something, but only if you're playing Dungeon World <laughs> because in Dungeon World, there's a rule that says you get XP if you fail rolls. which is to say you should be playing Dungeon World. They cannot imagine players who choose to make suboptimal combat decisions in D&D. They are incapable of imagining players making decisions for themselves that go against the incentives of a game. Uh, but they also somehow don't conclude that then Dungeon World is about failing at everything. Instead, they conclude that Dungeon World's good incentives allow you to tell more interesting stories, stories where characters take risks. Oh God. Role-playing games are a conversation is a good start. The rules guide that conversation. The rules tell you what to say, the rules tell you when to say it, and the rules tell you what you are allowed to say. 
So with supporting evidence from its shithead author, Dungeon World isn't about constant failure because, allegedly, the game tells you when you are allowed to make a suboptimal decision. This isn't true. Uh, it kind of can't be. The game has to rely on players using their best judgment, which throws a wrench into this whole thing. <laughs> but if a game does do all this, then the goal of a Suitsian TTRPG is to properly understand what the game thinks is cool and what the game thinks isn't cool, to behave exclusively according to its input, to say only the things the system allows you to say at the moments you're allowed to say them. So Orders came to him through a monitor at his desk, telling him what buttons to push, how long to push them, and in what order. Come back to Emiloy takes this idea to its natural conclusion by saying that you should design games that contain, quote, pointed leading bribery to trick players into reinforcing the actions that you want as the designer so that they take them even when the bribe is gone. They are literally saying their goal is to secretly alter your long-term storytelling values. They're saying that games are creepy. <laughs> Uh, which sounds uh, really familiar, actually. Um, if, if you think that that's the job of a game designer, this is starting to sound really familiar because and those of you that did your homework last time know where this is going. Uh, you're, you saw this coming a mile away. <laughs> but if this is all true, if TTRPGs are Suitsian and you have to rely on them to tell stories correctly, then it doesn't matter if you think you can tell a good story without storytelling rules. That wouldn't count. It'd be like taking a taxi to the finish line, and uh, your story probably wouldn't be the, any good anyway. You know why? What's going on, day dwellers? Um, it says here, because playing Vampire the Masquerade in the 90s gave you literal, yes, literal, I meant what I said, literally literal brain damage. That can't be right. Except it is. Also, yeah, that's the same episode. <laughs> what are the odds, right? <laughs> Whether this is true or false or patient zero, I don't like letting Ron Edwards out of the bag. Uh, so instead of doing that, we're going to look at a contemporary tabletop role-playing game and see if it does everything these people are saying it does. It better be specific, comprehensive, and self-contained. And it better fucking work. And if it doesn't, if there's something else going on here, which I think is likely, well, I know where to look. Root the Role Playing Game, published by Magpie Games, was written and designed by Brendan Conway and designed, written, and developmentally edited by Mark Diaz Truman. Which is a red flag. Please don't edit your own books. It has additional writing by Sarah Doom, copy editing by Kate Unrao, proofreading by Catherine Fackrell, layout by Miguel Angel Espinoza, and, of course, art by Kyle Farron. It made over $600,000 on Kickstarter in 2019 and was, at one point, one of four Kickstarters being simultaneously fulfilled by Magpie Games. Because, you know, Kickstarter's rules stop existing so long as you're making them hundreds of thousands of dollars. <laughs> they did actually send me uh, this copy of the core book upon my request, um, but the rest of the deluxe set I later acquired as part of a joke gift from a friend. Thank you, Fiona. <laughs> in Root the RPG, each player embodies a member of one of the core Root factions that I haven't really talked about yet. The Vagabond. The Vagabond is usually a lone mercenary type figure, but in accordance with the board game's continuity, whatever that means, your adventuring party is a group of Vagabonds, the first ever Vagabond Band. That's what the book sets out to help you accomplish. So how does it do? Well, let's start with what I like. All PCs are kind of thiefy, so it has some example consequences for failing thiefy actions, which is kind of nice, as are the examples for how to leverage your clout when interacting with a faction. From page 112, a positive relationship might get you resources, lodging, or even military backup. But with a negative relationship, they'll only provide a few moments to hear you out, or with a minus two or minus three, the most you can ask for is, quote, a head start. 
By far, that's my favorite line in the book. Speaking of which, it says here to always modify that role with the NPC's true faction allegiance, even if they're a double agent and it gives it away, which I can respect. Um, I also like the procedures for brewing and crafting, both good, very quest-focused. Um, scavenging is abstracted, which is appealingly simple. There's a useful table for setting up NPCs. And finally, they describe how the Eerie Dynasties expands their control by subsuming local governments into their own structures and bureaucracy. I kind of hate to spoil what's to come, but it was very refreshing to see actionable, original world-building even if it was 90% of the way through the book. Because that's it. In 256 pages, I found eight things that I mostly liked. Or maybe nine, because they do make a Skyrim reference. So, let's see what else is in the book. The book has a very rocky opening. The entire first chapter is just a whole lot of ad copy for eight different products. First, they pitch the IP. Root was originally a board game, they explain, while well, name dropping which awards it won and how many times it won them, mentioning each expansion by name and listing their constituent factions one by one, half of which aren't even in this book, by the way. <laughs> it then continues advertising to you, the book you're actively reading right now. Here and elsewhere, it tells you that this game is super special and that your stories will be awesome, funny, moving, involving, and exciting, and that you won't necessarily find that in other games. <laughs> they then pitch their Denizen deck and their equipment deck and their Day One DLC hardcover expansion book, which we'll talk about later. Uh, don't worry, I won't forget about it uh, because they keep mentioning it periodically throughout the entire book. Now, I don't like ad copy in my books on the best of days, but I don't know how they ran out of things to say so quickly. There are entire sentences here that look like they're copy pasted from a thesaurus. In fact, in this opening spread, the like first spread of the book past the table of contents, it describes the player characters as rogues, vagabonds, roguish vagabonds, scamps, survivors, rogues again, outcasts, miscreants, heroes, legends, miscreants again, rogues again, renegade heroes, knaves, maybe heroes, and maybe heroes. <laughs> It's repetitive, poorly written, and, I can't emphasize this enough, tries to sell you eight different products in the first seven pages of the book. That's pretty dire. It immediately gets worse. <sighs> On the very next page, in chapter two, they continue pitching their Day One DLC hardcover expansion book twice in the same paragraph while introducing Root's setting, The Woodland. Here's how they begin the section, The History of the Woodland. The history of the woodland, dot, 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 is unknown. <laughs> That's right, no one knows, because if no one knows, the writers don't have to write anything. This is how they approach every detail of world building in this entire book. In particular, this slim 12 page chapter, which contains almost every single world building detail in the entire book, is just a quick, yet somehow still extremely repetitive, narrativization of the board game. The Marquisate invaded, the Eerie retreated, the Woodland Alliance started accruing sympathy. It adds nothing new. Almost. The section about the Grand Civil War includes similar hits like, no one remembers how it began. The details are unclear, confusing, and complicated. <laughs> Suffice it to say the exact causes have been lost to the chaos of time. Okay, thanks for nothing. How about... Who's in charge of each faction? Well, the answer isn't written in stone. Maybe the Marquis is in charge of the Marquis, but maybe she isn't here. Maybe the Eerie is really ruled by its viziers, or a general, or a noble, or a manipulator. Who knows? Quote, there is no perfectly concrete objective truth. I hate this. It's all the worst impulses of anti-canon world building proudly on display, and it just keeps going. A sidebar explains that you can't play as a deer or a moose. So your cool root OC can't have antlers. It's explicitly against the rules. Why? Uh, well, there's no essential truth here, no mystical reason, no ancient secret to uncover. You can't play as deer because deer are something like spirits. They never expand on this, ever. That is the only time the word deer is used in their entire product line. They're just wasting space explaining that you can't play as a deer for no reason at all. No, wait, it's worse than that. Their wording here actively discourages you from coming up with a reason either. <laughs> Skipping ahead real quick, you also can't play as a fish, um, <laughs> which is marginally more understandable. But it's not because fish are monstrous or magical. 
It's because your friends are assholes who would ask how your gills work every five seconds. Literally, the book says they'd ask every five seconds. That's a direct quote. I would just set a timer. This is especially confusing because a mere six pages before they say no fish, they beg a similar question. What do foxes, notable carnivores, eat in the woodland? That's a fair question for this fable-like game whose setting has lots of travel and war and who is frequently compared to Redwall, which has lots of feasts. <clears throat> so what's their answer? Don't think about it. Just don't think about it. Food? Oh, who cares? Everyone eats the same stuff. Probably bread or, or hardtack, which is just a sneaky way to say bread twice because they can't be asked to come up with even two ideas. This world building, or lack thereof, is criminally incurious. This setting is supposedly a region at war, but the kind of war where questions like who's involved, who's in charge, what are their tactics, what do they believe, and where does the food come from aren't worth answering. Or rather, it's worth specifying that there is no answer, especially in the book, and also sometimes you're not allowed to come up with your own answer either. On the surface, this just looks incredibly lazy. But upon closer inspection, it still looks incredibly lazy, but for a really bizarre reason. You see, again and again, Brendan Conway has insisted that every decision in Root the RPG was made to be as faithful to the board game as possible. So, through that lens, this complete lack of imagination stems from the fact that they didn't need to answer those questions when making the board game. When Patrick said, hey, I want to do an asymmetric strategy game, and I said, cool, I want to make it be about counterinsurgency, the question of where we set it and how it appears, that was like a day two question for us. This is Cole Worley, um, the Root board games designer, saying some very smart things in a very good panel about, uh, about like the history of fairness and game balance and how maybe we should be critical of those things. Um, <laughs> when he says he wanted uh, the game to be about counterinsurgency, he's talking specifically about making a game inspired by the coin or counterinsurgency board games of GMT games. In these board games, you play out your own version of a real-world counterinsurgency event, like the Cuban Revolution, the Vietnam War, the decolonization of India, or the modern Afghanistan War. Root obviously, differs from these games in at least one very important way. Kyle, it was work, we were working on this adventure game, um, and Kyle was setting it in this sort of Robin Hood-esque animal world, and it occurred to us that that actually might be the perfect way to theme the game, because I don't care if your Woodland Alliance are Mar Marxists or if they're like militia radicals. I want the players to be able to kind of like fill in the ideologies so that the players can kind of project and inhabit the world. This choice, among all the other factors that led to its runaway success, was a brilliant idea to, ply, to apply to the Root board game. Not everyone wants to play out a real world conflict and Kyle Farron's art is maybe the most beautiful thing I've ever seen on a game store shelf. <laughs> uh, but, but unfortunately, unfortunately, this is also the exact same approach that Magpie Games tried to take for Root the role-playing game. No characters, no details, no world-building, no ideologies. Fill it in yourself. The problem with that is that while they clearly hate writing, they did have to extrapolate some things from the board game's theming to make it fit a role-playing game. You really have to dig for it, but you can see it in their word choice. The Eerie Dynasties have captains, sergeants, and elite guards. The Marquisite has treasure wagons, barracks, troops, offices, and... Then they hit a snag. Because if you look at the board game, the Marquisite also has recruiters, who presumably recruit from the local populace. And, you know, speaking of the decolonization of India, I've seen RRR recently. That sounds compelling. It's a role-playing game, so things can be a bit more messy. Root doesn't have to be as simple as cats versus mice. So, to represent the local populace, they added a faction that's not in the board game, called the Denizens, which consists of mayors, sheriffs, and civilians. And then they hit another snag. Because that means that now, the Woodland Alliance are not regular people. They're one of the factions. And in an unforced error, Magpie Games decided that in the world of Root, there's no good guy faction. Textually, all the factions must be presented as equally morally gray. This decision pulls double duty. If all the factions are the same, they don't have to write anything to differentiate them. Thank God. 
But hilariously, it also makes the factions balanced. And I don't just mean mechanically balanced. Mechanically, every faction is equally easy to befriend or upset using the most poorly explained reputation system I've ever seen. Look at this absolute disaster. But the factions are also fictionally balanced, which comes off a little politically weird when, in the section The Rise of the Alliance, they start to describe them with words like rebels, stockpiles, revolt, bushes and bows, and cells. That's cells as in terrorist cells. And all of a sudden, I'm keenly aware that Marquisit is a French word, and the cats say they're here to save the woodland from itself. And then this bald eagle starts looking a little fashy. And then I'm like, wait, you're telling me this game is based on this board game, which is based on these other board games, one of which is set in the same country in the same year as RRR, which stands for Rise, Roar, Revolt, but that the rebels are just as bad as the colonists? The answer is yes, the book is saying that. <laughs> It even goes so far as to say, in one of the only bits of strategic specificity in this entire book about factions at war, that the rebels are the ones who perform false flag operations, as if that's not a counterinsurgency tactic. They then double down by saying the Woodland Alliance stirs up trouble by provoking the other factions. Just proudly spouting propaganda while framing anti-colonial action as provocation. Emergency update. In early 2022, Magpie Games made a statement about their Denizen deck after landing in some hot water when people noticed that their lizard cult faction of religious extremists who practice religious martyrdom had villainous members named Kazira Rijal and Ubare Moset, leading some to draw etymological connections to Arabic names and Islamophobic stereotypes. In the statement, Magpie Games said they didn't intend it to be a metaphor for any single cultural tradition and pointed out that there are good lizards who are cultists too, like Opal Moon Rider and Hibiscus Grey. <laughs> it turns out names are political. Thank you for tolerating this interruption. Back to your regularly scheduled AAA program. There's some degree of plausible deniability here because they didn't write anything. <laughs> so someone could conceivably say, no, the Wooden Alliance are like an alt-right militia. I don't think that's a strong argument, but if it were, it'd mean this is a game about choosing between fascists, colonists, and fascists. So presuming that's not the case, and knowing this is a role-playing game, not a board game, I can't help but wonder what it would look like to act against the Woodland Alliance in-game. Is what I'd say if the book didn't already do it for me. You draw back your arrow, sight down the shaft, and let loose at the Woodland Alliance rebel charging at you. You're targeting someone. <laughs> This reads like American Sniper, the RPG. The book clearly thinks that framing all the factions as equally bad will lead to tough decisions. I disagree. I think it leads to no decisions, because if there are no details and all the factions are the same, where's the choice? I've seen other tabletop role-playing game writers handle colonization in a mature way by specifying what the colonists offer. It could be tough to choose between enriching yourself by helping colonists and hurting local people and not enriching yourself. <laughs> but in order for that story to be on the table, which I'm not against, is if the designers actually write factions that offer different things. Factions with goals, leaders, tactics, resources, knowledge, and worldviews. Unfortunately, those details are totally absent from the root IP, and Magpie Games certainly didn't add them here. I already know the book's solution to this problem. They'd say, don't think about it. Thinking about that isn't part of the game. <laughs> It's one of the book's many seemingly innocuous no-nos. Things that you aren't allowed to do, or that you should try your hardest not to do, or at least not do very often, please, because if you do, it eventually takes you away from the game's core experience. Root the RPG is constantly shouting all throughout the book. Things like, don't think about food, hands, fish, larynxes, ideology, home ownership, or faction membership. Don't prep, don't argue more than once per character per session. Don't try to trick the other players, and don't help your friends in the fiction unless it gives you a numerical bonus. If you disagree in real life, take a majority vote. Don't roleplay your party meeting for the first time. You're already friends for life. Who did something cool off screen together before session one? And don't roleplay a new vagabond joining the party either. Just decide out of character why you already met and how you already get along. <laughs> 
Reading this feels like being a cloud that an old man is yelling at. It's like, you play anthropomorphic animals, okay? Not humans, just animals. And they're anthropomorphic, which means they kind of have hands, but also kind of not. Uh, don't think about it. And if you slip up and think about it, just stop thinking about it as soon as possible. <laughs> Like, come on. I've seen Disney's Robin Hood. I know what furries are. It's 2023. You put anthropomorphic animals holding weapons on the cover of your book. My friends and I aren't going to argue about hands or how big a wolf is. And if we do, who cares? Maybe we'd have fun explaining that. Maybe I want to play a fish footman in livery. You'd think that's my business, not the books. But all these no-nos are framed in a very specific, very peculiar way. This framing was important enough to me that for the first time in my life, I dog-eared a page, because this page contains my least favorite sentence in the whole book. In general, the PCs are a team, a band of vagabonds. They might not always agree, might not always get along, but this game isn't about the strife between those vagabonds. If they're arguing so much that the entire group is at risk of fracturing, then that's going to interfere mightily with Root the RPG. God, where do I even start? My story! You've destroyed my work! So, the primary goal of sections like this is to preserve the integrity of the story, which is to say, the experience that is allegedly provided by the book. It's not about you, or your table, or your friends, or your story. It's protecting the book. The imaginary, platonic ideal of Root the RPG. It doesn't matter if you think it'd make for a more compelling story. If you disregard these guidelines, you're interfering with the game, exiting its spotlight, focusing on all the things that it has loudly told you are the wrong things to focus on. Focusing too much on these setting details is not only unproductive, it's also contrary to the core setting of Root the RPG. You might say your experience is exiting the game's artistic frame, which makes it sound like Root the RPG thinks these vague guidelines are Suitsian rules. It's saying that after some unknowable number of in-character arguments, after an arbitrary degree of too much focus on your equipment, if, God forbid, you join a faction officially, you've broken the rules of the game. You're on your own now, doing something that's no longer Root the RPG. <laughs> I know this is a weird place to start talking about the rules, but it's emblematic of the book's perspective, because if this mountain of vague arbitrary guidelines, which seem to have very little bearing on the game, have to be followed for the true experience, if these can be rules, then anything could be. Which is a good place to be, because it's now time for Chapter 4 and Chapter 5, The Core Rules which introduce the things that will haunt me until the very final page of this book. Moves. When you buy Root the RPG, you're paying for moves. From here to the end of the book, there are over 150 moves. That's one for every 1.25 pages. There are so many moves that the index just stops listing any mention of them past page 211. Based on the consistent templating, the lack of proofing errors, and the emphasis that's placed on them in the text, it's clear the creators prioritized moves above everything else in the book. Moves are... So, the word move doesn't actually mean anything. It's a catch-all term for a rule, any rule that fits into one of the book's 11 categories. There are basic moves, and weapon moves, and playbook moves, and session moves, and a can of worms, and NPC moves, and increasing a stat by one point. That's a move, too. I tried to chart them out, which helped a little. Uh, turns out they do eight different things, but let's start with the 53 that match what most people think of when they say move. These moves are described as discrete chunks of program-like rules. If you haven't been paying attention, that is weirdly fitting. But what, what this means is that <laughs> move these moves take the form of if-then statements, like in robotics and computer programming. The idea goes that while playing the game, you'll eventually reach a moment of uncertainty that matches a move's if statement. So you roll 2d6, maybe add or subtract a number, and then receive an outcome or set of outcomes that you choose from to determine what happens then. So that's four parts. Uncertainty, if statement, stat resolution, and then statement. I'm sorry to say we kind of have to take these one by one in part because the book's definition of uncertain is 
very weird. From page 31, and I'm going to get some dice to demonstrate. The only times you use the dice during the conversation are when the moves and the rules call for it. Especially if you're familiar with other role-playing games, you may feel a desire to use the dice to resolve moments in the conversation that you think are uncertain, even when there isn't actually a move to roll. Don't do that. If there isn't a move to resolve the uncertainty in that moment, then it's not actually uncertain. Just use the can of worms. I don't think a can of worms will be very helpful right now, Root. And frankly, I'm baffled at how confidently they've said, if it's not covered by the rules and you think it's uncertain, you're wrong. Like, <laughs> first of all, go to hell. Second of all, their own expansion book has more moves that cover uncertain fictional situations that you can definitely encounter while using just the core rules. Like rifling through an NPC's notes. Your character can do that even if you haven't bought the expansion. So is it uncertain or not? Do I roll with cunning or do I have to use the fucking can of worms? The short answer is um, you can't roll with cunning. You have to use the can of worms uh, because they're paywalling your imagination. <laughs> For the long answer, well, let's talk about stat resolution. This game has five stats. Charm, cunning, finesse, luck, and might. And while they might sound familiar, Root the RPG is correct. They don't work like other games. In most TTRPGs, stats are the point of heuristic. If the outcome of an action is uncertain, you look at the character's stats, figure out which one matches their action the best, and then use that stat one way or another to help resolve the action. But Root the RPG, well, most days I'd rather die than apply video game vocabulary to a role-playing game, but uh, Matthew Matosis' video on context sensitivity is unusually applicable here. They suggest that, in video games, each action lies somewhere along a spectrum of context sensitivity. So, going to our default example, example, in the Stanley Parable, walking is a relatively context insensitive action. As long as you're not trying to walk through a wall, you can walk pretty much wherever you want. Interaction is more contextual, it requires a button or a monitor or a door, and picking up items is extremely contextual. The only item you can pick up in the entire game is the bucket. It goes without saying, I hope, that this is not how tabletop role-playing games work. <laughs> On the opposite end of the spectrum, Matthew Matosis suggests that Breath of the Wild is a game that tries to make every action as context insensitive as possible. You can climb anywhere, glide anywhere, light fires and use your sword in all kinds of situations, all without button prompts. A large part of this game's value is attributable to the way it blends this insensitivity with a robust set of simulations and the kind of pre-made open world only possible on a major publisher budget. This sounds closer to how most tabletop role-playing games work, except that in TTRPGs, you don't need a huge budget to do this. What's special about this medium and what video games have tried to replicate is that the world can react in a logical way to any action you can imagine. This is mostly thanks to how context insensitive stats are as a resolution mechanism. To use game terms, it's because you can use your might or finesse or any fictional object to affect, as Matthew Matosa says, a vast array of world features. Or rather, that's how you might expect it to work. But as we read, Root the RPG explicitly disallows that. You don't use your stats to resolve uncertainty. You use moves which moves this game's conflict resolution way closer to button prompts. I'd like to address at least one objection. Licensed games. Take the charm stat, for example. Seven of the game's nine playbooks, uh, playbooks are kind of like classes, um, can only use their charm stat in two specific situations. To persuade an NPC, or to figure out what someone is feeling. Same goes for the luck stat. Most playbooks can only use luck in one situation. When that situation comes up, you're expected to trigger the move and it supposedly goes off like a line of code. <laughs> I have a million problems with this, but the weirdest one is that now it's against the rules to say, it sounds like this action relies on your finesse. Roll 2d6 and we'll make a ruling. Or this sounds more like intimidation than persuasion. How about you roll with might instead of charm? Except, Funny story, you can do that second thing 
but only if you're a ranger who chose the threatening visage move. You can also get this move by multi-classing, but it's not a great choice, especially as each character is strictly limited to stealing two moves from other playbooks. So unless you take this move, it doesn't matter how high your might is, how threatening your character looks, or how hard they're hitting the trigger for threatening visage as opposed to persuade an NPC. They can only use charm, which is so bizarre to me, uh, and it's also how every move in the game works. Like, if you don't have the skill that lets you throw sand in someone's eyes, it is impossible for you to throw sand in someone's eyes without a negative side effect. Something will always go wrong. You could do it 50 times in a row and something would go wrong every single time. This confused me for a very long time, but I think I figured it out. Playbooks are action figures, and playbook moves are the voice lines they say when you push their buttons, right? So if you don't have threatening visage, which you probably don't, you're not the kind of character who would intimidate someone. You're the kind of character who would persuade them. <laughs> it's literally the book saying, that's, that's not, not what, what your, your character, character would, would do. do. This means your stats and your moves are, I'm gonna say it, incentives. It's the book saying, look at your big plus three bonus to cunning. You should take some actions that use it. Here are the only four actions that use it. Do one of these. Here are your buttons, push them. So, how do you push them? What is this game incentivizing you to do? Well, I mentioned the uh, action that triggers Threatening Visage is different from the trigger for Persuade an NPC, right? So, let's talk about if and then statements. So, this book is secretly a dictionary. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry, I know, that's a weird claim. Okay, hear me out though. Um, so I mentioned that moves are context sensitive, right? But I need to emphasize just how contextual they are. This book put so much emphasis on clarifying every single detail of every single move that it tripled the length of the book. I am not kidding. Remember the table of thiefy actions that I mentioned earlier? In case you don't know, it tells you that hiding is disappearing from view or remaining hidden, which, come on, using the word hidden in a definition of hide, that's like the number one dictionary faux pas. And you might not think this is that bad. It'd be a pretty empty table without this column. And yeah, but <laughs> that's not the definition I was talking about. Hide. Slipping into a closet and closing the door, finding a spot among some barrels, any attempt to remain stationary still and unobserved until danger or time has passed falls under the hide roguish feet. Hiding is often reactive, something a vagabond will do in response to an incoming danger to survive it. Vi, does it give all nine of those words their own paragraph? Yes, it does. So just in case you don't know what acrobatics are, or what sneaking is, or what it means to pick a pocket, the book wants to make absolutely sure that your definition matches its definition. And remember those uh, consequences that I mentioned liking earlier? It defines all of those too. <laughs> break something means you break something. Detection means you get noticed. Draw unwanted attention means you create dangerous attention. Expend resources means you use up supplies. Leave evidence means you leave evidence. Plunge into danger means you wind up in more danger. Take too long means you take too much time. <laughs> That's the number one dictionary faux pas seven times in a row. Surely the book's just doing this because it's the first move, right? It's not like it does this with every single move in the book. It does this with every single move in the book. What does it mean to tell the truth? What is a promise? What is a bribe? What counts as a strong motive? How about best, most, control, hesitate, stumble, overreact, cost, fleeting, collateral, opportunity, obstacle, plead? This book is filled with paragraphs upon paragraphs, pages upon pages of definitions and clarifications and parameters. After reading literally hundreds of definitions, I felt like the book thought I was a complete idiot. It literally doesn't trust me to know what words mean. In that Adam Koble clip I played earlier, he was reacting to a sentence from Ultraviolet Grasslands, which reads, Obviously, what counts as a hard battle is subjective, but you've got the idea now, negotiate and talk. You can do it. It's one of those infamous I trust you lines that certain people seem to hate so much. Adam was mad, the book trusted him. He wanted it to give him an exact definition of hard, just like Root the RPG does. <laughs> The fact that this book is secretly a dictionary is a feature, not a bug. So seeing as this is on purpose, what is it for? Why do this? Well, uh, it's because definitions are very easy to write, and they wanted a book with a thick spine, and they wanted every playbook to start on a right-hand page. 
But also, if stats are incentives to get you to trigger moves, the book wants to be very clear about exactly what it's incentivizing, because those exact situations and their exact results comprise the game. That's why you're not allowed to ignore when a move is triggered, and why you're instructed not to ignore or fudge the results, only interpret them as written. It uses a few more tools to help accomplish this, in particular the move Trust Fate, which is called the underlying basic move for the entire game, is explicitly a disincentive, aka a punishment. You use it when you're faced with overwhelmingly tremendous odds that you couldn't possibly get through unscathed, or when you take any action that you don't have the move for. If a PC acts and no other move that they have access to quite fits the situation, but it's still risky and chancy, then it's trusting fate. <laughs> so actually, you could use trust fate to rifle through someone's notes, or intimidate someone, or throw sand in someone's eyes. But you don't want to, because unless you build your character around it and want to fail, using trust fate is a punishment. There's no way to use it and be fully successful, because that's not what your character would do. Your character would do these things. The character who would do that is in this expansion. Buy it now for the privilege of rifling through an NPC's notes. <laughs> this isn't the kind of worms, but it's lurking around here somewhere. When creating a character, you also pick two drives from the four that were hand-picked to best fit your playbook from the broader list of 15. Um, these are more explicitly incentives, like the book uses that word repeatedly. It's how you earn XP, so the book is really excited about them being rewards for good behavior because that's what it thinks XP is for. <laughs> in fact, your drives are so important that there's a move that affects you in real life. It tells you and your friends to sit around in a circle at the end of every session like preschoolers and take turns reading your incentives aloud one by one. <laughs> you know, just so you don't forget which story you're supposed to be telling here. <laughs> And they do sound like little chunks of story. Like, you advance by toppling a tyrannical or dangerously overbearing figure or order. And, of course, in case you don't know what topple or illicit or significant or impressive means, the book is still dishing out definitions. Like, when they talk about drives, there are over 23 definitions in these four pages. Just that little bit that I flipped through right there. Just briefly, um, this makes that bit from before about the vagabonds being maybe heroes completely ridiculous because heroism is incentivized. You're required to be heroic if you want to level up. Uh, I seem to recall someone saying, being good for a reward isn't being good, it's just optimal play. So much for tough choices. <laughs> Moving on to equipment, the tag system is fine, but at this point it just feels like another way for the designers to avoid writing anything, is what I'd say if it wasn't actually a way for them to show their equipment deck is what I'd say if it wasn't actually both because they don't write anything interesting on the cards either. Chapter eight, oh God, it's the can of worms. Let's, let's come back to this. Chapter nine uh, has a way for you to generate your own woodland with a boring version of the board game. And I'm saying that as a person that once played an entire game of the board game from start to finish, all four factions by myself. Um, I went through this whole process though, and I tried to do a bunch of silly creative stuff. Like, um, there's only like 16 names, but there are 12 clearings, so I rolled some duplicates. Um, so I renamed them Old Open Sky Haven and Old Wind Gap Refuge, saying stuff like, It's all flavor in the end, only one rabbit clearing, and look at all those foxes! That's storytelling, baby! But immediately after that, the book said, actually, I wasn't allowed to do any of that stuff. There must be exactly 12 clearings, with an equal number of fox, rabbit, and mouse clearings, because... That's how the board game is balanced. <laughs> and every clearing needs a different name from our list. Great. I'm sure this is very important for the game's narrative or its balance, um, and not complete nonsense that gets thrown out immediately if you use even one officially published adventure, including the one later in this book. Hmm. <laughs> the chapter also includes some random tables for fleshing out your clearings. They're nothing special, but they work. Um, I rolled three adjacent clearings that all hated the road damage, which personally I would use as a running joke. But while doing this, I couldn't stop thinking about how much of a missed opportunity this was. The board game it's based on is literally a point crawl. If the writers wanted to stick religiously to the source material, the glaringly obvious correct move here would be to name each clearing forest and river, and then write the damn book. 
but we get this crappy generator. So can I really complain? Also, this section only has one move, um, but the first printing has a sudden influx of proofing errors and this one really egregious layout overflow error that crosses six pages. I don't know how in the world they didn't manage to catch this. Almost as if they didn't care as much about this section. Uh, it finishes off with that move I mentioned and, um, <laughs> okay. Uh, so you know how I said, if the Woodland Alliance are fascists, it means there's no good faction to back. Um, that's because, uh, the core pitch of the game, according to the author and the back of the book, um, is that you are clearly expected to choose a faction to help quote. Oh, I think it's here. I can just read it from here. You choose whom you serve, if anyone, but everyone knows you may tip the balance of the war. It's the maybe heroes thing, right? You'll tip the balance. Guess where the rules are for tipping the balance of the war? In the fucking day one DLC. I haven't read it and never want to because this book paints a very unappealing picture of its expansion book, Travelers and Outsiders, which I'm not gonna get down because it'll destroy my set. It brags that the expansion has 10 more playbooks, which means at least 60 new moves. No, thank you. New factions with additional world building, which I can't bring myself to be excited for since it admits it only changes the implied history. <laughs> it has the faction rules for tipping the balance of the war, which should have been in the core book because it's part of the core premise of the system. And finally, the last thing they brag about shoving into the expansion is critical successes. They paywalled natural 20s. What the fuck? The final chapter is an adventure called Galila's Grove. It's not nothing, but it's not good. Um, it has weird stuff like, um, okay, so the Marquisite is usually the industrializing force, but this clearing already had a sawmill before the cats arrived. Like, that's literally the cats' thing, but okay, whatever. Not like the setting mattered anyway. There's an overworked, underfunded police department. Yay. It says the foxes here make flawless and cutting edge bows and arrows, and then they immediately forget about it. Uh, like, it doesn't even tell you what makes them special aesthetically or mechanically, even though one NPC, yes, only one, has a Galila's Grove bow as if it's something special. And that NPC isn't even a fox, even though the fox is the one making the bows. She's a cat who came here recently as a representative of the Marquisite. <laughs> The clearing has four core conflicts, one of which is shown in the chapter art, where there's a goat arguing with a fox. It looks a little bit composited, but it's a functional piece of art that was recently replaced with something that has nothing to do with the adventure. So that's cool. <laughs> I do like that there are four core conflicts, um, but the writing is straight up not good enough to support it. Uh, but it's not just that the writing's bad, it's that it was crammed into this terrible info design template. Let me walk you through how it works. They start by describing the clearing's background and then what you see as you approach. Then they describe the clearing's background and its future. Then its background and its future. And then its background and then its future. And then its background and its future. Then they detail the NPCs, many of whom are now being introduced for the third time alongside info that would have been very useful to know about five pages ago. And then they detail some important locations and items and finish off by describing the clearing's background and its future for the sixth time. It's fundamentally broken. Like the adventure's last page, which is basically the last page of the book is titled Introducing the Clearing. <laughs> In case you're curious, yes, this is the template they've used for every single one of their officially published adventures. I couldn't wrap my head around how this happened until on Twitter, Magpie Games' community manager seemed to insinuate that the company writes into their layout program, which would explain so much. <laughs> so, points for trying, I guess, because there's almost no such thing as a PBTA adventure, but beyond the sudden resurgence of proofing errors and the broken info design, this could have been one or two spreads, but it's 14 pages, which is just emblematic of the book. Oh, and the adventure introduced 40 new moves. 40! How is that possible? Well, you see, <laughs> each NPC has three things that they're likely to do written in a bullet pointed list instead of, I don't know, a good character description. <laughs> and apparently when you narrate them taking one of those actions, that's a move too. <laughs> and it also introduces three more moves right at the last second that I missed like every previous time I counted that happen when you just advance one of the core conflicts. So then why are they so far from the core conflict descriptions? And why are they moves? <laughs> Well, 
Um, <laughs> Want to open a can of worms? Chapter 8, Running the Woodland, has a few things in it. Uh, it has a big example of play. Um, that chart I mentioned for statting up NPCs. Um, it references a list of names that doesn't actually exist anywhere in the core book. Um, it has a sidebar with <laughs> terrible advice about how to prevent PvP. And it has this book's GM moves. GM moves don't work like regular moves. You don't roll dice, the triggers work differently, and there are no pick lists because these are like way broader in scope. The book explains GM moves like this. They're the moment moment steps you take along your principles toward your agendas. You know, uh, agendas are your destinations, principles are your paths, and moves are your steps. <laughs> my annotation here reads, this is so nonsensical it's melting my brain. But that's not really fair. It's simpler than I thought. Here's an example. Let's say things slow down in the narrative or at my table. That's one of the triggers that says it's time for me to use any GM move. So I look at the list and decide to reveal an unwelcome truth. I decide the NPC they've been traveling with is suddenly missing. This is a step I'm taking along the principle, make the factions and their reach a constant presence. Maybe their friend was wanted by the Eerie dynasties, but they decided to resupply in an Eerie controlled clearing anyway. So I'm using the Eerie to cause trouble because I want to pursue the agenda, make the woodland seem large, alive, and real. Right? So it was an action I took for a reason toward a goal. Hmm, why do I have a problem with this? Well, part of my problem is that it takes them 18 pages to say what they did in one column with the quick start. Oh shit, there's a list of names. Most of it is also just copy-pasted game design from Apocalypse World. Um, just like all of Magpie Games' games, actually. You can't copyright game design, which is good. Um, and it's padded with in-universe examples, so it's not technically plagiarism. But if that's still not a problem for you, as Magpie Games has gotten increasingly successful, there's been a clear pattern of them crediting Vincent and McGay Baker's Apocalypse World less and less. Here's a brief tour. The Masks Kickstarter mentions Vincent by name, but later projects are only described as hacks of Apocalypse World. Then Root lists Apocalypse World as one of many games that uses the PBTA system, which, sure, technically true. And then their $9.5 million Kickstarter that they did later didn't even mention Apocalypse World. Now it's just the PBTA framework made famous by games like Root the RPG. Fuck off! There are eight written reviews on the entire internet of this shitty book. There are 12 if you count YouTube videos, barely scraping over double digits. Sure did a lot to make the PBTA framework famous though, huh? <laughs> and if all that still isn't enough, Magpie Games' new Urban Shadows 2nd Edition Quick Start also doesn't mention any of those things, but does open with the literal murder of a man named Vincent who's killed by being stabbed in the back. <laughs> A little on the nose there, Magpie Games. That's enough for a big ol' from me. But my main philosophical problem with this is that these copy-pasted agendas, principles, and moves are framed as rules, which fundamentally changes the nature of using them at the table. <clears throat> if I had uh, abducted an NPC, like I described earlier, and it wasn't a move, it would just be business as usual. Me exercising my share of creative control over the story according to my own creative impulses. But now, even if it's the exact same action, this new framing makes it look like me cleverly using the mechanisms of the game. <laughs> I think it's important to emphasize here that this framing is completely alien to me. Like, it's off the charts bonkers in every way. This book is basically trying to tell me that everything I say as the GM is actually me following a rule written in Root, the RPG. <laughs> I think the book would try to disagree with that. Um, it clarifies that you're not making a GM move every time you open your mouth. Like, if I did nothing but reveal unwelcome truths one after another, that'd be a very weird game. But I stand by it. Because immediately after this, it says, every time you say what happens next in the fiction, you're making a GM move. Which sounds a hell of a lot like everything I say is a move. Especially when it's three examples of things that aren't moves are finishing out the results of a PC's move, which if it weren't already a move could actually be one of two GM moves, 
talking as an NPC, which we've already established is definitely a move, and describing a scene, which isn't a move, but is a principle. <laughs> You see why this is a can of worms? Because now we have to ask the question, are principles rules? I think that the book thinks they are, and here to corroborate me once again. Describe the world like a living painting. That's fucking cool. This is the mechanism saying, describe your game like Kyle painted it. Here's Adam in a video sponsored by Magpie Games calling principles mechanisms. Their rules, which means we need to talk about the other half of this claim. When every word you speak exists in relation to a rule, then every word you speak is either following the rules or breaking the rules, which makes all this feel a lot less like advice and a lot more like disavowal. It's a defense against someone saying, this game doesn't work, our session crashed and burned, no one knew what to do. Because if this is in the book, people can diagnose you and your players within the rules. That's why junk like this ends up in game books, so that people can say, mm, maybe your world didn't seem alive enough. You didn't put danger in seemingly safe settings? Next time, try mm, capturing a PC. In other words, follow the rules. But that's just it. People will go on and on about how rules like this are supporting your play, but this shit isn't supporting your play, it's just describing it. Let's not beat around the bush. The Vagabond character, where'd they go? The Vagabond character was perfect for a TTRPG because it's emulating in the board game tabletop role-playing games. It's emulating games that have been around since the 70s, like, you know, D&D. <laughs> Games like D&D &D have built a long legacy of techniques that help players and GMs bring the setting to life to make it feel large, alive, and real. Telling the players, do it or you're breaking the rules, isn't anywhere on that list. It's not helpful, it's not supportive, and for the record, it's still not beginner friendly. If we keep reading, it says you shouldn't blandly set scenes, you should quote, paint a picture, but a living picture, with motion, with multiple senses worth of description, with tone and mood and hue. <laughs> Don't describe like a boring tavern. As with every time I see useless platitudes like this in books, I have to ask myself, does the book really believe this? Does it practice what it preaches? And just like every time, the answer is no, it does not. The book's adventure, Galila's Grove, describes three locations and none of them including the boring tavern. Describe any colors, smells, textures, or tastes. The fox's arrows are described as being colored with a proprietary dye, but they don't even say what hue. In this entire book, whose setting is called the woodland, the word green is used once. It's all bullshit. It's a snake oil routine, selling you the promise that all this cruft is worth something. That in this book, the world is colorful because it's a rule. It's not like those other books that don't have rules about their worlds having color, but it's lying. All of this is useless. And for me, it was the moment that the book finally finished falling apart. Figuratively. The uh, glue has been coming undone since day one. I'm not done talking about Root the RPG. We're not out of the woodland yet. But uh, I want to start talking less about what's literally in the book and more about why it's there. I want to figure out how the hell we ended up with a book like this and why the hell I'm talking about it in this video. To do that, we're going to address something that's kind of been hanging in the air. Is Root the RPG a Suitsian game? Nope! <laughs> so... Rude the RPG is wearing the clothes of a Suitsian game, but when I say it isn't Suitsian, I'm talking about how the bones of the Suitsian framework don't line up with the activity of tabletop role-playing. Playing a TTRPG will undoubtedly involve goals, obstacles, abilities, and an environment, but I don't think any of them match the Suitsian model at all. Like... <laughs> Uh, Root the RPG is not unique in this regard, but uh, I don't know, we've been talking about it for over an hour, and I it's very important to me personally that we deconstruct this argument, so we're gonna 
use it to do that real quick. This game, just like every other tabletop role-playing game I've ever read, doesn't have a Suitsian goal. You cannot win Root the RPG. All of its rules and mechanisms and standardized measures describe a state of rule following that it expects you to sustain until whenever you finish telling your story. As chapter 8 says, Agendas are endless objectives, not goals to be achieved and forgotten. That is literally the opposite of Suitian games, where goals are knowable end states that you can achieve. Like, there's a paper arguing that chess doesn't even have a fully lucery Suitian goal. Do you think uh, uh, trying to argue tabletop role-playing has Suitian goals will withstand any degree of scrutiny? No, not even close. Goals are the most important part of the Suitsian model, but if you recall, the reason you don't just move your score tracker to 30 is because no one actually cares about the goal. They only care that they got there by overcoming the game's obstacles. In the board game, the obstacles and abilities create new choices that it has control over from start to finish, that can be measured in a meaningful way, that can only be used in a completely known context. It has control over, almost, every single variable, which is what makes it good. To make it all work in harmony, all you have to do is try to win the game. But that's not how Root the RPG works at all. <laughs> not only because there's still no Suitsy and Gold to chase, but also because the rules aren't clear enough to count. Like, GMs, not game designers, have to create and adjudicate every obstacle and every action, and players have to do some work interpreting every single ability. Which means there are an infinite number of actions that match each one. A role-playing game cannot have control over choices from start to finish in the same way that a Suitsian game can. This is why they wrote hundreds of definitions. Like, they definitely think that players are stupid, and they want you to imagine doing all these things in a row so you can imagine how good their game design is, but they're also trying to solve this problem. Except they failed, <laughs> because while it's incredibly easy to measure points and board game pieces, it's actually a lot harder to measure imaginative storytelling. Which is why everything constantly feeds back into all the harm tracks, because you can measure that. <laughs> Not only is that bad role-playing game design because it prioritizes numbers above make-believe, above the fiction, it also just feels like more distrust. Like, the game has no way of knowing if your consequences will be any good at all, so it just tacks on to the end. Always, also, you, you always take one exhaustion, <laughs> because it's trying to legitimize its game design um, by, by, by like appealing to board game logic instead of maybe finding a game logic that's unique to role-playing games. Wouldn't that be cool if we did that? Hmm. Even if we ignore that there's no goal and we pretend the abilities or the obstacles are clear enough that a game designer could take partial credit for what happens at the table, a lot of what happens at the table doesn't even involve game abilities or obstacles. The book tries to dodge this by claiming that even when you're not interacting with the rules, you're still following the rules, <laughs> which is so laughably false, it's literally a joke. Like, you know the game? Shit, I just lost the game. Are you familiar with the game? No. Yes. You are, okay. I just wanted to make sure. I just wanted to have you lose the game too, if you're playing it. The game is an unwinnable game that you never stop playing. Anytime you think of it, you have to loudly announce that you've lost, causing everyone in the vicinity to also lose the game. The joke is that once you start playing, all of your thoughts are actually you playing the game. <laughs> like, if you're eating food or watching a movie or exercising, those are good strats. You're winning the game. Keep up the good work. <laughs> and wouldn't you know it, the Stanley Parable makes a similar joke with its go outside achievement. The Stanley Parable is constantly trying to control you and take credit for your actions. And the logical endpoint of that is that choosing to not interact with the game must be a way to play it correctly. <laughs> it's saying that by choosing to go outside and make real choices, you are still doing exactly what the game told you to do. It's basically mind control. <laughs> Very funny stuff. Root the RPG makes these same claims, but not as a joke. <laughs> it's written so that every action at the table comes into contact, 
however briefly, with the rules. I, I spent so long focusing on the can of worms that is GM moves because it's the most blatant part of this all-encompassing effort on the part of the designers to take partial credit for everything that happens at the table. This is the claim it's making by giving you a book with nothing but rules and constantly saying you have to follow them because its rules create your actions, even when your actions are not meaningfully constrained by the rules. Unfortunately, that's so divorced from how rules and creativity work that again, it's literally a joke. The final nail in the coffin is that the environment you're making choices in isn't standardized at all. When you make a choice in a TTRPG, even a choice that is within the rules, the factors you're taking into account are so contextual, so personal, and so easily influenced in a very real way by an infinite number of unknowable factors that do affect the game state, that it is different in kind from a choice made within the rules of a Suitsian game. We are literally talking about a group of friends around a table creating a story for their personal and collective enjoyment based on their own tastes and influences. The idea that their choices are exactly and exclusively created by and aligned with the game is nothing short of dehumanizing. It is denying the human complexity of the players, acting like not only like they can follow rules like robots reading lines of code, but also that that's the only proper way to play a role-playing game. If you're not gonna be convinced by a YouTuber, <laughs> there's a very good paper you can read called The Forms and Fluidity of Play that explains how games of make-believe are not Suitsian. The author wrote it because of how often people, including Bernard Suits himself, have tried to conflate these two inherently different activities. The paper's author, oh, it's Tino and... We were talking about this, I don't think they're, most of it, they're Suitsian games. Yeah, I actually, no, no, I, I, uh, I actually cut out some stuff from the book on role-playing games because I thought the Suitsian analysis didn't fit them. Although whenever I talk about this, I create a riot and people just start arguing. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you the reasons. Nguyen was very generous with his time and tolerant of my growing interviewing skills. Yeah, um, but I'm, I'm pretty proud of the interview though. It's probably, it's probably linked below. Um, but we did never return to this question, um, which I will regret for the rest of my life. Um, <laughs> but with my arguments and a citation and soundbite from the philosopher himself, I hope we can definitively, I I'm going to definitively say that this rule set is not a proper closed-ended Tsutsune aesthetic striving game. It doesn't reflect how the game's actually played, like, here's someone playing a deer, oh no, so game-breaking. <laughs> and the rules have no way to see or measure you because the experience of role-playing isn't constrained enough to make that possible. So if anyone else quotes Bernard to explain role-playing games to me after this, I am going to personally dunk them into the fucking sun, okay? TTRPGs are just radically different from what Nguyen is talking about in this book. But I can't just dismiss this rules only perspective on tabletop role playing game design if for no other reason than it's been around for most of the hobby's very short history. Even if TTRPGs are radically different from Suitsian games, it's still worth asking. What meaning does this carry in its own context? Does it add anything to Root the RPG? You might be surprised to hear that actually, I believe it does add something. And that thing is extremely valuable. Chapter 10, wait, really? Yes. <laughs> the extremely valuable something is called marketing. Yes, marketing and yes, the forge. Take a look at this. I got the shitty textbook, I got the cork board, and I got the bag we keep Ron Edwards in. This right here is the forge. Now let's talk about the forge. Can we talk about the forge? I've been dying to talk about the forge with you all day long. I'm casting a wide net with this video, so I bet some of you are internet weirdos who like long videos about obscure topics you know nothing about, such as the forge. 
But even for people who are participating in the TTRPG scene, it's very fashionable these days to have no idea what the Forge is, even while actively carrying on its legacy. In fact, even the Forge is upset that, despite their huge influence, no one remembers the Forge. It's literally the first claim on page one of this textbook. <sighs> so apologies to the people who did their homework, but for everyone else we should probably answer that question. What the hell is the Forge? Well... There's this dusty old web forum called The Forge, which, according to the excessively long title of this textbook, was active from 2001 to 2012. On the website's forums, a bunch of predominantly white, predominantly dudes did a lot of talking about tabletop role-playing games. The most prominent of those dudes was Ron Edwards. Ron Edwards dominated the conversation at The Forge. His name is more or less synonymous with the site. He's the one that wrote the article called System Does Matter. He's the one that said bad games give you brain damage. And he authored the two models of TTRPG play that are most commonly associated with The Forge which I'm not going to mention by name because I don't want to explain them. <laughs> this textbook, which we'll quote in a minute, is about how Edwards and the Forge are super cool and smart, which means there's a lot in here that's going to start sounding and smelling a bit familiar. Remember our mind control boys, Crane and Sorensen? Wait one sec. This book cites them seven times and 19 times respectively because they're from the Forge. It's why Sorensen called himself a founding father of indie RPGs because even today, indie is often synonymous with contemporary Forge ideology, in part because the Forge Forums' URL is indie-rpgs.com, <laughs> which is a very 2001 URL. Speaking of Luke Crane, his job at Kickstarter, which I mentioned earlier, eventually ended amid controversy when he launched a Kickstarter whose contributors were listed in reverse alphabetical order by first name. <laughs> in a move that seemed to be an attempt to hide the fact he'd hired on our boy, Adam Koval. Because less than a year earlier, Adam ended his own career when he played out a horribly inappropriate scene in a live-streamed actual play which he was GMing. It has been thoroughly documented if you want to look it up, but it is worth mentioning here that he partially blamed the incident on a lack of rules. <laughs> Adam's most famous game, Dungeon World, which people somehow still endorse to this day, was a hack of McGay and Vincent Baker's Apocalypse World, a game that literally has Adam's name in it because he helped playtest it. Also, these two were asked to contribute to the perfect RPG but they pulled out because Adam was involved. Vincent was a notable member of the Forge, meaning Apocalypse World is, in my estimation, the most impactful game to come out of the Forge. For example, basically all of Magpie Games' increasingly profitable games are also powered by the Apocalypse, including Urban Shadows 2nd Edition, the one where Vincent gets stabbed in the back, and Pasión de las Pasiones, which is written by Stop, Pack, and Roll's very own Brandon Leon Gambetta. Oh, what's that one? Don't worry about it. In the podcast episode, Encouraging Incentivization, Gambetta lists a bunch of games that he thinks have good game design. Those games include Urban Shadows First Edition, Adam Coble's Dungeon World, Paul Sega's My Life with Master, which Ron Edwards also cites as a good game in, you guessed it, the Brain Damage article, and Ben Lehman's Hot Guys Making Out, which we'll briefly mention Ben, but not their game. And surprise, surprise, Paul and Ben are also cited in this textbook because they're all from the Forge. Except for Mark Diaz Truman, who's from Magpie Games. <laughs> and Root the RPG, actually. Before Adam got cancelled, Magpie Games sponsored his video advertising the Kickstarter for their PVTA game, Root the RPG, because all of this, including Root the RPG, comes from the same ideological space, bada bing, bada boom. While it might be easy to point at my murder board and say, oh, it's story games. This is a sequel to your Dread video. That's... Correct. Story gaming came from the Forge. This is a tiny slice of what the Forge called narrativism, or as I like to call it, secret gamism. <laughs> but I'm not just going to condemn all of story gaming because that'd be a stupid thing to do. Um, and also because no one is free of sin. Forge bullshit is bleeding into every genre of role-playing game. I hate it, it's everywhere, and it's making books worse. And it all started with this one guy. That's right, it's finally time to unpack Ron Edwards. Figuratively, uh, from the uh, proverbial bag. <laughs> For those of you that do know about Ron Edwards, which I don't know, I'm not surprised if you don't, his games aren't exactly popular. You probably rolled your eyes at me bringing up his brain damage comment, even though I've been foreshadowing it for ages. <laughs> for I think literal hours at this point. Even Edwards was already sick of how much people hated this comment way back in 2006. <laughs> 
People really hate his brain damage comment, because it's mean and clearly wrong. Yet Edwards doubled and tripled down on it and gave himself the final word on a forum he owned with a thread he opened and eventually had to close due to unimaginable backlash. <laughs> Hello, editor's note. That line was written like six months ago and then rewritten like two months ago. The line was originally, Ron gave himself the final word on a forum he owned with the post he made with the comments turned off, because I thought that's what happened. But then I started going looking for that, and I was like, no, the comments are open here. He closed them because of the backlash. So I changed the line. I shouldn't have, um, because I was right. I wanted to be accurate. Uh, this is a big project. It pains me to do a little editor's note like this, but um, we're doing it. And I was looking for a screen cap of that post, and I found it two days after he closed the thread. He made a post on a forum he owned with the comments turned off, which started with no retractions, no apologies, because it's important to his theories that this is true. Um, so that is, uh, that's where we ended up. That was the, the last word he gave was on a post he made on a form he owned with the comments turned off. No retractions, no apologies. So thank you for letting me unamend the script. Back to the video. It's an easy target is what I mean. Everyone brings it up. Even that textbook devotes a whole section to it. So you know what? Because of all that, let's do a little extra due diligence to try to figure out what the heck he meant. The forum post in question is simply titled Brain Damage, but one of its first sentences links to a far more interesting post started by a person named Jesse on the topic of Edwards' game Sorcerer. Jesse opens the thread with the Ron Edwards quote, where Ron says that Sorcerer's complex group resolution mechanisms are easier, faster, and more reliably decisive than any known RPG relative to the detail. What a humble guy. <laughs> Jesse disagrees though. He thinks Edwards' game might have some bugs. In the first of five examples, he posits a player who wants their PC, Abigail, and her demon to play out that trope where the door handles jiggling, they make eye contact, and both dive for a hiding place. The problem with that, Jesse says, is that the GM can arbitrarily choose to fuck over the player by making the pet demon take any other action. I think this is frustrating for some people, Jesse said. In response, user Bill Cook did a point-by-point -point breakdown of all five examples to explain why Jesse is probably wrong about everything. <laughs> Immediately after this, Ron Edwards himself came into the thread to basically say, Well done, Bill. I taught you well. This diagnosis stuff is exactly what we do here at The Forge, because it is, before performing his own point-by-point -point breakdown of why Jesse's wrong about everything. <laughs> In response to the demon scenario, he wrote, Number one, Basically, too bad Abigail. You can't get what you want. Jesse, you see what's going on, right? The player is trying to play the demon. However, the GM plays demons. That fundamental rules break is the single and only source of frustration in your described situation. If the player were not trying to break a rule, he or she would not be having this problem. His other four analyses are basically too bad, too bad, Bill's right, and you can't use my rules to stop players from making character choices even if it totally looks like that's what my rules do. And then he finishes off the post like this. Jesse, none of the above are patches. Everything I say up there is applying my rules exactly. There is no discrepancy between the written rules and what I'm saying here. And I'll kneecap the next bastard who says different. Whoever it is, I'll tell you now, the game is better than you. Best, Ron. Jesse reacts to this by saying, sorry, chef, you're right, your game is perfect. And then Ron gives him a merit badge. This isn't even the juicy stuff. This is just Ron being a prick. The juicy stuff is right here, a few posts down, where he's still talking about Jesse's examples. Your set of examples is more or less a diagnostic board of what I've been calling, with various reactions around the internet, brain damage. There are so many bent and broken features of creativity and interaction embedded in those examples that it'd take a textbook to lay them all out in a way which shows what's really wrong. I bet money he's talking about the DSM-4, but... How's that for textbooks, you fuck? <laughs> so, <clears throat> Sorcerer's narrative-heavy action economy said Abigail could either hide or try to control her demon in case the GM chooses to fuck her over, but not both. If Abigail's player still wants both characters to hide, that's a sign they have a... Mm, bent and broken imagination. In saying this, Edwards is selling you two ideas. The first is that players are physically incapable of telling good stories. Conveniently, this positions his game Sorcerer and games like it as very valuable products 
You're telling me Vampire the Masquerade broke my brain, or more realistically, my player's brains, and you have the cure? <laughs> no matter how silly this idea seems, it's still around today. It's the idea that players are idiots. I mean, that they've learned bad patterns of behavior from playing bad games, and they now require good game design with good incentives to tell stories correctly. Earlier in this very video, we saw Gambetta saying this exact thing while citing members of the Forge over and over again. The second idea Edwards is selling you is more presentable, uh, but it's also way more interesting to me. He says that if a poor, unfortunate soul such as yourself wants to make the best of what you've got, you have to fully commit to using his rulebook in a very specific way. Not as a storytelling aid, but as a prosthetic in place of your imagination. For it to work, you have to forget how you think tabletop role-playing works and fully commit to following all of Edwards's perfect rules to the letter. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, the thing that allegedly breaks your brain isn't a game or a book, it's an idea. It's the horrible, terrible, destructive idea that you can interact with the TTRPG rulebook as if role-playing is some kind of freeform fetish ritual and not a manifestation of Ron Edwards's very cool and correct big model of games. <laughs> Which, wait, shoot! Oh, god damn it. I said the magic words. At the beginning of this section, I offhandedly said that the people on the Forge forums did a lot of talking about TTRPGs. But there's a problem with that. If anyone wants to talk about tabletop role-playing games, they have to... find a way to talk about them. That might seem excessively basic, but really, in other mediums, if you want to be boring, you can kind of drop boundaries around the text. When you talk about a movie, you can talk about the movie. When you talk about a script, you can talk about the script. When you talk about a book, you can talk about the book. But when you talk about a game, what do you talk about? This is not an easy question to answer. You might recall Nguyen spent an entire book answering it. He ended up with Suzian games, but what did The Forge end up with? What was The Forge trying to talk about? Well. Here's Mahar on the excellent Trying to Be Kind podcast, which you should still listen to episodes 6, 7, and 8 of, reading a bit where this textbook quotes Forge theorist Ben Lehman. The only consideration of Forge theory is the real people participating in the play of a role-playing game. We are going to talk about nothing that isn't the players of the game. Knowing what we know, this is an extremely important claim. The Forge wanted to talk about the players of the game because players are responsible for creating the text that the Forge wants to talk about. Players are wholly responsible for what the game actually looks like at the table. Um, usually we talk about what happens at the table by calling it play, um, and, and I'm going to make that same ideological move, right? So the Forge wasn't trying to talk about games or books, they were trying to talk about play, yeah? Okay, so to put it simply, The Forge was trying to talk about nothing but the players because, as game designers, they want to increase the reliability of good outcomes and reduce the frequency of bad outcomes, which they called functional and dysfunctional play. Who put the ABA weasel word in there? Was it The Forge? It was The Forge. <laughs> I'm not the first person to suggest The Forge might have been talking about rules, not players. The Trying to Be Kind podcast says it more than once, and this textbook tries to refute it. Apparently, someone, who they don't bother naming, said that Forge theory would be less confusing if they admitted that they're talking about books, not players. The only rebuttal offered by the textbook is, well, that can't be true because it'd mean we lied. <laughs> Great argument, man. I'm totally convinced you aren't still lying. I should mention, this textbook might be biased because it was written by a member of the Forge. If the Forge was talking about players, they only did so by imagining players as blank slates that get all their thoughts from the book and its rules. It's literally how this textbook describes the Forge's gamist narrativist simulationist framework, which is a nonsense theory, by the way. Footnote. It says that while GNS was evolving into the idea of creative agenda, some members of the Forge got confused because GNS said players do whatever the book tells them to. But now, Edwards' new theory says players can bring their own agendas to a game, even agendas that don't match the game or maybe don't match the other players. From page 126. But the shift was slow. 
The nuances of this new approach were obscured by the fact that it did understand individual players to possess their own sets of GNS priorities. That's right, the old model, GNS, relied on the idea that players don't have thoughts, which makes perfect sense. As Gambetta said, behaviorists don't talk about thought. The Forge didn't want to talk about thought because thinking is the source of dysfunction. In ABA, behaviorists try to get around this problem by making a list of all the behaviors they decide need to be corrected and then arranging incentives to make you stop making wrong choices. It is not a framework where you have agency. It is a framework that has one correct answer, which it expects you to perform. The Forge stumbled upon this same problem that actually maybe players do think and resolved it in the same way. You can see it in Edwards's new framework, which was called the big model of games. This new diagram seems to say that players do things at the table. Players use techniques to do those things. Players are driven by the things they want from their game. And of course, players do things wrong. This is what confused the Forge. <laughs> there was no room for thought in GNS, but now Ron's saying players are doing all kinds of things? Weird, that sounds like it might cause some problems. But remember, GNS evolved. As the last piece of this model, GNS became the creative agenda. Just like before, the agenda in question here does not belong to the players. It is the designer's creative agenda for exactly what every aspect of play must look like. This is the mind control facility. Instead of just controlling how players approach the game, in this new model, the designer's intent pierces all the player's thoughts and actions, holding them in a prescribed place so that nothing that happens at the table is allowed to go wrong. It's a model of TTRPG play that is founded on the principles of radical behaviorism, that your thoughts are behaviors, your feelings are behaviors, and all of them can be manipulated with reward and punishment as consequences. Of course, the solution to players having thoughts of their own is to control those thoughts with rules and incentives and game design. This is why Root the RPG believes that everything is a move, and why so many people still believe that everything is a rule. Because rules control your behavior, and in order for this model to work, everything you do at the table needs to be controllable. <laughs> and you know what? You'll never guess which philosopher this shitty textbook cites to validate the Forge's fixation on rules as a form of control. That's right, it's motherfucking Bernard Suits! Get over here, Mr. White! Okay, so we both know that tabletop role-playing games are not Suitsian, right? So this is bullshit. But when Edward says that players' storytelling techniques, desires, and behaviors happen inside the rules, and then Mr. White says, and that's Suitsian, <laughs> they're saying that they can gamify tabletop role-playing that with rules alone, they can turn this nearly infinite, creative, social activity into a capital G game. A minimum viable product, a term that's borrowed from computer programming, by the way, which will reliably produce functional storytelling. This project is the board gamification of role-playing, the gamification of the social contract. It's not gamifying how pieces move around a game board, that'd be fine. It's gamifying the things you and your friends are allowed to want and imagine, as if you can be manipulated as easily as a board game piece. When Nguyen says that gamification is mind control, and then says it's the death of everything particular and human and flexible, this is what I think of. It might not be what he thinks of, he's in an ongoing Apocalypse World campaign. Fun fact. But I think of this. The game is better than you. Social contracts are usually negotiated at the table between you and your friends, and you change it when you need to. It's called play for a reason. But in the mind control facility, the contract is set in stone. It tells you what is correct to want, the correct way to get it, and to not step out of line. Brendan Conway and Mark Diaz Truman aren't from The Forge, um, but they are closely associated with The Gauntlet, which luckily for us, 
is a direct product of the Forge. <laughs> but even if it wasn't, they don't need to believe in the big model TM for all this to be true. Root the RPG is an inflexible, gamified social contract taking credit for everything you create at the table for a very good reason. If you take the human particularities out of the equation, you get the idea of a reproducible experience. And you can sell that idea. <laughs> I began this section with the word marketing because reproducibility is a concern of capital, of mass production. And while I could and will yell some more about agency and human nature, this ideology succeeded. It succeeded astoundingly well, not at mass producing behavior, but at selling the idea that it could. This idea, the idea of Root the RPG, made over half a million dollars before the book even existed. And now that it does exist, almost no one has talked about or will talk about it ever again. The main exception to this, besides this video and whatever reaction it creates, is Magpie Games Incorporated's marketing campaign. Oh, yeah, by the way, um, they're incorporated in New Mexico. <laughs> Magpie Games is a corporation, and by God, they are way better at being a business than most other tabletop role-playing game companies. If you couldn't tell, this is a very embarrassing field to be a part of sometimes. Like, Magpie Games is still stuck churning Kickstarters like everybody else, but, you know, at least they have ISBNs and, like I said, an actual marketing strategy. And that marketing strategy is, to me, weirdly fascinating because if my claim is that Forge ideology is a mind control facility that never worked in the first place because it's really just a smokescreen for using behaviorism and board game logic to market systems with the promise that systems create reproducible experiences, then that'd be the evidence. It would reveal what Magpie Games is selling. So let's take a look at that. Obviously, they're selling uh, physical objects, the dice, the cards, the bag, the screen, even the books. If you love the board game, it's all more or less root merch. They're also selling the promise of a good time, which is a pretty unremarkable message, but their method was to commission an actual play where all the players follow all the rules. This is Forge ideology. It's saying that these actors are having fun because they're following the rules in this book which you can buy. <laughs> this is actually one of two videos they commissioned from Good Time Society. In the second one, Becca Scott explains how the game's rules work. As we talked about before, the rules make a lot of promises about what's in the game. Deer spirits, bear monsters, ruins, carousing, random encounters, treasure, equipment, factions with leaders, a living, breathing world. So Scott uses these promises to advertise the book saying things like, you'll travel through bandit-infested forests, and you'll use your reputation to interact with powerful factions. From where I'm standing, it sounds like this advertisement is trying to sell you, root the RPG, based on the idea that all these things are in the book. But that's an easy mistake to make, because none of that stuff was ever going to be in the book. In reality, this advertising campaign is trying to sell you root the RPG. <laughs> Not root the RPG. Root the RPG. I dog-eared that one page that I showed you earlier because it reminded me of the difference. Root the RPG is this book, but Root the RPG is play. It's the highly prescribed play that they expect you to create at the table. This last thing is what the entire book is written to convey and what this entire ideology is built to sell you. The idea of a perfect game where everyone gets along and all the consequences are real and the world is cool and the factions are complex. The idea of an experience with those qualities, with the promise that it will be delivered by the system. If you do all the work, and let me be clear, you will have to do all the work to make a game like that, then it qualifies as Root the RPG and gets sold back to you. It's, it's your own behavior sold back to you as if your work is the product of the extraordinariness of a game designer's achievement. That's what's in the book. An empty, gerrymandered shape whose lines are drawn with behaviorism, which you have to do all the work to fill so that the book can take credit for it and sell it back to you. <laughs> if you crack it open, that's almost all you'll find. I say almost because there is something in this book that supports your play, but Magpie Games Incorporated is not interested at all in trying to sell it to you. 
None of the advertisements talk about this specific chapter, and only two reviews say anything about it besides also this exists. You want to guess which chapter no one cared about? Galila's Grove. The Adventure. Before the publication of this video, there were 423 words written on the entire internet about the adventure in the core book. That includes one board game geek comment and a YouTube video which I had to transcribe to get an accurate word count. That's fewer than I wrote in this one video and I didn't even go all out. Do you know why no one talks about the adventure? Because the advertising language we've inherited from the Forge only works to market game systems. So that's all anyone talks about. <laughs> if you've ever heard someone on TikTok or YouTube talk about an indie game, they probably described the premise and then started talking about the rules because our entire culture is based on this. <laughs> like that template is literally just the first two of Jared Sorensen's three questions. And the third question is, you guessed it, behaviorism. <laughs> Fuck. There's no room in this framework to talk about adventures or gameable content or even the quality of the writing, which is usually pretty bad. It's just premise and game design and rules and systems and gamified social contracts advertising to you an experience that isn't in the book they're selling you and isn't what you get when you play the game. If the Good Time Society actual play is an advertisement, then Rootless, a game of might, right, and arson, is not. It's a peek into someone's home game. When I watched this AP, I quickly realized these folks are having a blast, but what that what's happening at their table is not really root the RPG. <laughs> the GM goes by Woodland Whisperer for some reason instead of just Game Master. They use the dice even when there isn't a move to roll. The GM makes rulings all the time. They have that deer PC. They have a fish faction whose members use rebreathers to walk on land. <laughs> and most importantly for our purposes here, one of the players got really attached to the arsonist drive. If you couldn't tell by the podcast's title, this TikTok ad, and their incredible intro song, which reminds me of like Minecraft parody songs <laughs> in the best way. <laughs> The joke is that, like the board game, this is a game of might and right and arson. So much arson. That's funny, but it's not true. They came up with the slogan before recording the show, so they didn't know if it would be true, and it turns out it's not. And I'm fine with that. It's, it's okay. <laughs> they don't need to commit more arson. <laughs> but I find it so funny how the rules said, in this game, you commit lots of arson and they wanted to commit lots of arson, and there's a mechanical incentive for them to commit arson, and they named their show after it. But when they actually played the game in 22 hours of edited playtime, thank you by the way, they only committed one arson. <laughs> I know I get stuck on dumb little things like this, and the fish thing, and the deer thing, but I don't know. When I look at Cal, I get mad all over again. Why can't you play as a deer? Deer looks so nice in Kyle Farron's art style. And... Hmm. You know, Magpie Games licensed the Root IP for a lot of really good reasons. Uh, the large existing consumer base, the brand's history of success on Kickstarter, its reputation as a good game, um, it's recognizable to brick and mortar stores, there's the seemingly apolitical premise, and uh, story gaming's alarming inability to create intellectual property, <laughs> but there's not a doubt in my mind that their number one reason, the most valuable part of the Root IP for them, was Kyle Farron's art. The company knew this literal book didn't need to be any good at all because its $600,000 Kickstarter success happened not because of the writing, which didn't exist at the time, but because of Farron's art. And while thinking about that detail and all the others in this mess of a book, the thing that came to mind was the question from the beginning of this video, the one that Mark asks Miss Cobell, what is it we actually do here? We the viewers of Severance still don't have an answer, but you know what? I realized we do have an answer in the case of Root the RPG, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. You're not allowed to play as a deer because Kyle Farron never drew a deer. Rules as written, you aren't allowed to play as a deer because the intellectual property this corporation licensed, at the time they licensed it, it didn't include art of any deer. 
That's the real reason, and the only reason, which makes everything else fall into place. This book's a fucking corporate map for behavior. <laughs> it's meant to control the storytelling that happens around your table to match a corporation's idea of the root IP as if there are shareholders in your living room, making sure that the story, your story, aligns with their idea of the root product line. Those are the values embedded in this game. And frankly, holy shit. Fuck that! Like, brain damage, board game logic, imagination paywalls, that all sucks. But this book is actively trying to install a corporate cop in your brain to grade your storytelling? Like, that's its stated purpose? <laughs> How is this a normal and acceptable thing to put in a fucking game book? Is this the future of play? Is this what we want? Late stage capitalism making tabletop rule playing games based in corporate genre enforcement? We're gonna, we're gonna embolden idea landlords by asking for permission to make OCs in their IP? <laughs> like it's not a game unless you're adhering to values that you purchased? <laughs> yes. Apparently this is what we want. This strategy made Magpie Games Incorporated $9.5 million on Kickstarter with their Avatar The Last Airbender TTRPG. It really seems that we want corporations to give us products whose value is already exhausted before they even exist. Magpie Games isn't the only corporation doing this, making licensed IP shovelware the second most visible part of our medium, and it's not going to stop anytime soon despite the fact that it seems like no one reads this shit, no one talks about this shit, no one plays this shit. They just buy it. I don't know who makes my stuff. I don't know where my food comes from, in part because my tomato plant died again. <laughs> Everything around me is mass produced. Even this piece of art wasn't for me. It could have gone to any Kickstarter backer. I took this, frankly, mass-produced art object for a, a book which I have two copies of, neither of which I've read, and I assigned meaning to it, <laughs> which I'm starting to think is a little weird. But more and more, it seems like mass-produced objects are the only things we have left to create meaning from. I'm sure a group could find their own personal reason to follow every rule in Root the RPG, even if they weren't being paid. <laughs> but not only would they still need to do all the creative work themselves, that's also the same kind of compromise that Heli was asked to make. Find your own reason to follow all our rules. No thanks, you fucking corporation. My friends and I have our own rules, our own reasons to be creative. We can actually create and act within a, our own personal malleable framework. That's why I love tabletop role-playing games because they're my escape from all that. In the intro, I said, at the time, only one thing came to mind. But since the original silly thought experiment, I've found all kinds of things that I own that are made by the people around me. This is an original piece of art my roommate made of one of my player characters. She painted this for me with paint. <laughs> this is fucking personal and meaningful. For me, tabletop role-playing occupies the same place as this painting. Tabletop role-playing is folk art. <laughs> I'm Now, very importantly, I'm not talking about tabletop role-playing game books. I'm not talking about this. But the stories we create around the table with each other, that's folk art. That's you. That's art that you made. <laughs> I love making art like that. But now, some corporation, based on some bullshit forum theory from the early 2000s, is trying to alienate me from my own storytelling by mind controlling me into mass producing one of the only things I've got left in this capitalist hellscape. Fuck you, and fuck the effect it's having on this supposedly literary medium. I'm not, <laughs> I'm done, <laughs> okay? I'm not gonna be alienated from my tabletop role playing of all things. I'm mad that this is where we've ended up, but I still have hope. I can see a future in which TTRPGs are playful, where they lean into the strengths of the medium. I want that future to exist. The one where all our reviewers stop acting like aspiring advertisers. Where all our biggest publications stop writing fluff pieces to advertise Kickstarters and listicles to chase mainstream SEO. The one where players believe play is more than an imposed social contract and a rule set. Where creators stop writing games that tell you loudly over and over again on every single page what they're about. <laughs> Honestly, crack these things open, that's where we've ended up.
I don't think I'm the infinite font of wisdom for everything, but if I'm looking for restrictions to change the way I play in this medium, I'm not going to go looking for mechanisms. Honestly, one of the more unique things about tabletop roleplaying is how little the rules matter, how easy it is to change the rules, and how much of play has nothing to do with the rules. Rule sets pale in comparison to adventures in terms of their potential effect on roleplay, on make-believe. <laughs> From here on out, I'll be searching for that future. I'll be looking for books that lean into that playfulness, books that can be engaged with playfully. <laughs> I want cities, factions, classmates, neighbors, plants and animals, villages with problems, and yes, dungeons. We can write this stuff. We can write adventures that aren't railroads. We can write avatars that engender avatar identification. We can write compelling, specific details. And then we can let go of it all trusting that the players will create a story of their own through the simple act of moving forward. And players, forget about whether or not you're living up to the expectations of a corporation that's not at your table. We need to value radically personal reactions to art. We need to value making art according to our own values. I think those two things are what tabletop roleplaying is all about. When you roleplay, you take all this stuff and make something new that's your own. You make art with the rules and the adventure and with your friends and with all the infinite everything we could never see by looking in the pages of a book. And anyone who tells you different is selling something. <laughs> <laughs> Job. You made it to the bottom of the mind control facility. You jumped off the catwalk. You should have been careful. You should have been careful. It used to be a bug, but now it's an ending. Now it's an ending. And I believe in you. I believe in your ability to cross this barrier and chase your dreams. Railings don't mean anything. Good job, you did it. 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 Oh, by the way, you're fired.